Okay. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for attending tonight. This is the board meeting for Pajaro Valley Unified School District for March 9th, 2022. I want to welcome you here tonight, and if you have any need for translation, that we have a translator sitting here. And her name is Orania. So if you need a translation kit, you can get it from Orania. Thank you for being here. If you would like to speak tonight on anything on our agenda, excuse me. If you'd like to speak tonight on anything on the agenda, you need to turn in a speaker card um, prior to that agenda item coming before the board. The other thing is it's very important on your speaker card to put which agenda item you'd like to speak to because if it's not listed there, we don't know which agenda item that um, you'll be speaking to. So for Joe? Non agenda. Non agenda, thank you. Thank you. So every speaker tonight will have two minutes. We have a tracker up above that will keep track for you and get, we'll give you a 30 minute um, warning, I'm sorry, not 30 minutes, 30 second warning. <laughs> and thanks, thanks for being here. We're going to start out tonight with the Pledge of Allegiance and we'll have Tristy Holm lead us tonight in the pledge. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Our next item will be item 3.3, .3, our superintendent comments, and Dr. Michelle Rodriguez. Yes. We'll start it off. Yeah, thank you so much. So we have a lot of exciting things that are happening. Um, one, I just want to direct your attention to an action item that we're going to be having tonight. So we are um, planning on doing some significant stipends and signing bonuses for additional staff. We are fortunate, I guess in some ways, that we do have school districts around us who are experiencing layoffs, so we're actually going to be able to capitalize on that, um, as well as now with our latest settlement, um, we are the highest paying in Santa Cruz County. Um, and so when you look at the signing bonuses, you can get up to $7,500. And um, so we're really um, excited that this action item is coming forward. If you can scroll down just to the bottom for me. Um, the one, as we always mention, um, something that's really important is the fact that we pay almost 100% of health and welfare. So we often talk about net pay being really important. And so if you look at um, what happens after net pay, so you can't always just look at the salary schedule. Sometimes you have to look at what your actual take home pay is and you'll see that we're significantly higher than the other school districts around us and um, so we are excited about that. Secondly, I just want to talk about the, we, um, we were able to be part of a forum yesterday with the U.S. Department of um, Education around the great work that we're doing uh, with um, did the digital divide and um, digital equity. And so Dan Weiser was able to be there with me as well as Brenda Guzman, who is part of our um, parent coordinator team. And we were able to really showcase the work and influence the federal government on the work that's happening with um, internet connectivity and um, the digital divide. So we're proud of the work that we continue to do here for our students, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rodriguez, and congratulations for, for being selected to 
represent Pajaro Valley and California, really, with the U.S. Department of Education. That's really quite an honor. Um, next, we'll move on to governing board comments, and we'll start with Jen Holm. Thank you. Um, I attended the Second Harvest um, uh, Awards Dinner last week, and special congratulations to the Aptos Junior High team who were honored with a Hunger Heroes School Spirit Award for bringing in tens of thousands of meals. Other schools in our district were also honored, um, including Rio de Mar Elementary, Aptos High, Pajaro Valley High, and Mar Vista Elementary. And so I just wanted to express my appreciation for all the students, family, and staff that made the holidays a little easier for people in need. Thank you. Um, University Oscar Soto. Good evening, everybody. I'll defer my comments this evening. Thank you. And I forgot a very special trustee who's sitting next to Jen Itzi. This is our student trustee. Do you have anything to? to OK, thank you. Uh, Itzi Sanchez. Trustee Orozco. Um, sure, just really briefly, I just want to congratulate uh, our Watsonville Wildcats soccer team. They've had an amazing season, and so we're all just very proud of um, the entire team. And, of course, uh, we want to also thank the coaches who uh, have been there uh, for our students along the years. Um, in addition to that, I, uh, along with um, Dr. Michelle Rodriguez, I was invited to participate. Um, uh, in a forum panel conversation with our Empower Watsonville youth uh, group. And so the discussion was based on policy making um, and how they essentially their questions were around um, how they can bring policy about, how can they uh, really impact policy to really address key issues within their community that are of concern to them. So it was really uh, nice to have a conversation with youth here locally. I'm also part of the green team. We had a pretty productive green meeting um, a couple of weeks back or last week. Um, and so just for the community watching and for you all here present, if you haven't uh, taken the opportunity to complete our survey, make sure that you do, because that will be um, essentially informing um, our uh, projects moving forward. Um, and lastly, just a reminder that we do have um, the Pajaro Valley Education Foundation Gala on May 13th. And I'm proud to announce that Senator um, John Laird would be our keynote speaker for the night. Um, so that's all I have for tonight. Thank you for joining us. Trustee Jennifer Shocker. Thank you, President DeSerpa. So I too was at our district-wide green team meeting. Um, as Trustee Orozco said, it was very productive. Please do fill out the surveys because that gives us a chance to know what the students, parents want done with their schools. Um, I was also at the Migrant Head Start Committee meeting, um, going over our different policies coming up, new plans for the upcoming year. Um, Barbie Gomez was honored last night at the City Council, Watsonville City Council meeting for Girl Squad. Um, we do a lot of active work in, in our community um, from raising funds. We raised funds for the boys' championship soccer rings. Um, we had previously raised funds for the girls' softball rings, as well as CASA. Um, and other organizations in our community. Um, congrats to our sports teams, um, WH uh, Soccer Boys, Go Wildcats, the Gr Grizzlies girls team, and we know we have um, some wrestling champions um, from our girls. Um, Denisha went to states and came in second. Um, I was also able to visit Watsonville High School's campus with Trustee Dodge. Um, talk to Miss Nunez. I'm very jealous of her France trip and I want to join as a student. <laughs> um, also visited New School for their WASC recredentialing and went to visit the students um, during their Science Center visit on Friday. So, oh, one more important thing. We are doing a dress drive for special needs prom. So please contact um, us if you would like to. Information's on Facebook, information's um, all over, but um, we're collecting prom dresses for special needs prom. So we have porch pickup available or drop off at Church of Nazarene on Saturday, March 12th. Thank you. That's really great, thank you. Trustee Georgia Acosta. Um, I'm gonna yield my time back. Thank you, President uh, Trustee um, 
the Serpa Thank you. in interest of how many we have in the house tonight. And um, Trustee Daniel Dodge, Jr. I just wanted to also say congratulations, Barbie Gomez, for receiving your appreciation from the Watsonville City Council last night. Um, the things that you've done for the city of Watsonville, raising funds, donating your time it's you know it, it's a great thing and I, i'm i'm proud to have been part of a few things that you've sponsored and i just like to say thank you and i'd also like to request if we can have a report on discussion dr michelle rodriguez and uh the team on the girls softball field i know it's been an issue for a, a, a long time and i just wanted to see if we could give the community maybe um, a timeline of the last few years of you know some of the issues of why we we can't you know add lights or net or just something that we can tell the community why we haven't been able to upgrade the girls softball field at Watsonville High School. They've been champions a long time, and it's an issue I I hear in my district. So if we could do like a type of report and discussion just to let the people know what, what we can and can't do with the field. And I just wanted to say thank you very much and what a great one by the Watson High School soccer team. I, I, I attended their games. I, I saw the people, co you know, Coach H, Roland Hedgepeth, my classmate David Guerrero, you know, thank you boys, you know, thank you Wildcats. I mean, they've been winning CCS for decades, but just just to see the heart that this team goes through, you know, we you know, Watsonville High, we we don't have the best, you know, medical teams or the best equipment, but one one thing that makes us the best, you know, CCS, um, CIF wise, is we have a lot of heart. You know, we, we play for each other, we play for our team, we play for our school, we play for our city, and I, I just want to say congratulations, you know, team. And I just also want to say uh, thank you, you know, I'm not sure who put this together, Gus Paz or somebody, but the way we sent off our team to play in, was it, I'm not, not really, or somewhere, but the way the city of Watsonville, PVUSD, the way we, you know, Watsonville Fire Department, Watsonville PD, you know, Trustee Soto, Richard Martinez, you know, the bus drivers, the you know, we didn't come out on top, but, you know, we were there. And I just wanted to say thank you to the city of Watsonville for letting our, our boys know that we were there. And no matter what the result was, we're there and we appreciate you. So, go Cats. Thank you, Watsonville City Council Mayor Ari Parker and everybody, the other elected officials there to send our boys off. I just want to say thank you and uh, go Cats. Thank you, Trustee Dodge Jr. Um, I attended the Santa Cruz School Board Association um, where we meet with other trustees around um, the county and um, we had a great meeting uh, this week, a uh, um, couple of weeks ago, I attended the Pajaro Valley Prevention and Student Assistance meeting where um, we learned that um, the executive director has received another $500,000 grant and we're very proud of her. She's making uh, a real difference for the kids and families um, in Pajaro Valley with the expansion of services and behavioral health and substance abuse treatment. So congratulations to Erica Padilla and everybody that works with her. And um, finally, hearts go out to the people of Ukraine who are having to flee their country with their many children. And um, my grandparents were both born in Kiev. And um, it's, uh, it's a hard one for my family. So our hearts are with them. So with that, I'm looking for an approval um, of our agenda. Oh, I'm so sorry, 3.5. <laughs> High school student board report. Um, Aptos High School has provided a video, it sounds like. 
Here they are. Hi, I'm Chloe Chaucey, your ASB president. I'm Mia Archuleta, your ASB treasurer. I'm Alex Espetia, your ASB secretary. And I'm Jackson Miller, the junior vice president. And to start off, we have a ton of news from athletics. Uh, our Aptos cheerleading team just went to the CCS championships and brought home the trophy in an amazing performance. Our boys basketball team traveled to play the number two seed at Oakland High School, and they lost 56-50, but it was a great game and a great way to end their season. Our boys golf continued their hot start. We beat Gilroy, Los Gatos, and Soquel. Um, our lacrosse team are in a hard fought win over Salinas, and they traveled to Stevenson and Scotts Valley this week to play their games. Our swimming had a scrimmage match against uh, Arroyo Grande High School from SLO. Softball started the year facing some pretty strong competition, and they pulled off a pretty big 4 3 win over uh, North Monterey County over the weekend at the Watsonville tournament. Our boys tennis has had two tough matches out last week. We beat Monta Vista Christian and we battling top ranked Stevenson in our non league play. But we'll take on Harbor and Santa Cruz this week in our league action. Our track and field completed in their first meet this week at Aptos in the Santa Cruz Relays, and we put on a great performance. Um, uh, we had the highest overall team score and won that meet. Our boys volleyball uh, suffered, a, or suffered a loss and we got a win last week. A win against Soquel and a hard loss against Harbor, which is a very close game. And our beach volleyball will start competition, or will kick off their season this Friday. And for activities, this Friday we have our last club carnival that will be down in our quad. And next week we have our spring spirit week, which is going to be our last spirit week of the year. And we are currently in the middle of planning our lunchtime activities. And we have also started planning prom, which will be April 15th at the Coconut Grove. And for arts, we have the choir getting ready for their coffee house performance that's happening on the 12th, I believe. And the theater uh, drama class is getting ready for their production of Seuss School the Musical. Um, they're doing rehearsals every week as well as building days on Saturday. And they have launched their Snap Raise fundraiser, which has raised quite a lot of money for the production of the musical. Um, Alrighty, and then lastly for academics, seniors are still continuing to hear back from their colleges as well as finishing up any scholarship opportunities that are available and the Access Program and College and Career Club have really helped out with that. So overall, it's a great start for seniors. Great, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Aptos. Um, I've long been impressed with Aptos High's sports program. They have the largest sports program of any school, including the university and Cabrillo College, anywhere in the whole county. Um, the parents' dedication to getting their kids to practices, even when they were little, and all of that is, and the coaches and the assistant coaches, and for many years we couldn't really pay any of the assistant coaches or the coaches. So now that um, our budgets are better, uh, those people are being compensated and but for everybody who is a volunteer who helps kids achieve in the sports area thank you very much okay now I think do we have Herman here from Watsonville you're gonna present now oh okay great thank you okay so I'm looking for an approval for tonight's agenda I would like to make a, a approval with one change on the agenda. I'd like to move item 9.1 ahead of item 6.1. Okay, and I'll second that motion. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion passes 7-0. Um, and before we continue, um, this is what I make sure that I have the correct agenda item for this speaker card. Mark Morris. I'm sorry. It's okay. We're getting we're getting there. Oh. Yeah. Sorry. We're just yeah, correcting yeah, I was, the I was, speaker card. We're just correcting oh. the speaker card. Okay. <laughs> so I'm I'm just I'm confirming what agenda item you're speaking under. Uh, the masks. Okay. Thank you. The one that has the number on it. Great. Thank you. Can we speak now. Uh, Not no. no. We'll we'll call you right up. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Next up, we have approval. I'm sorry. Approval of our minutes. Move to approve. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes 7-0. Thank you. And I think next we have item, is it 9.1? Yep. Yes. Great. Yes. 
So 9.1 is a resolution 21-22-30 to strongly recommend the continued use of masks at PBUSD facilities. And the report will be presented by our superintendent, Dr. Michelle Rodriguez. Yep, thank you so much. So in August 2021, the board did a resolution to continue to observe CDPH requirements and require masks within the schools. Um, as I know everyone is aware, um, that has changed and there was a, a decision made by Governor Newsom that as of this coming Friday at 11.59, so technically I'm not sure why they chose that date, but um, so technically on Monday the 14th, um, masking indoors will now become voluntary. Um, so, so as, as has been um, our stance, um, we are continuing to follow CDPH requirements. Um, so we too will wind up making it um, voluntary. However, we are, by this resolution, we're doing one of two things. One, we're superseding the previous resolution which required the mask, and then two, um, well, actually three things. Two, we are highly recommending that people still do it. It is optional, but we're highly encouraging it. And so you can see, when you look at the resolution, you can see why we selected um, to continue to recommend it. Um, if you go to the therefores, which is the piece that I want to uh, make sure that we focus on, um, there are some things that we will continue to do. So one, um, we will continue to work with Santa Cruz County Public Health. Um, as was noted previously, we're at 2% district-wide. We are, we have a range of variation in our schools from 1% to 3% at this point, so the variation is very low. I do want to mention to the board and, and to the public that if we, there are on-ramps to add back on mitigation strategies. So it will not be this board's choice nor my choice, but um, public count, county public health, if we do have another reinsurgence, will reinstate the mask. And so I want that just to be aware that um, that, that will wind up happening. Um, and um, can you call order? So everybody needs to respect the order um, in this board meeting. No, you're going to respect the board meeting, or we're going to recess. Okay. We we moved 9.1 the resolution up before the public hearing, so that's what's coming before the board now. If we okay, so, go through this, yeah. So another piece that that we will continue to do is we will continue to provide the N95 mask to staff every six weeks. The next set will be coming out on, Mar on March 15th. Um, we will continue to provide surveillance testing twice a week. Um, the new guidance actually came out today in terms of that from the state. Um, so surveillance um, exposure testing will still be required if there are exposures. Um, the difference between previous times and now is it includes, required testing includes both vaccinated and unvaccinated students. Um, we will continue to monitor air quality and we're going to be providing additional HEPA filters as required for immunocompromised students and staff. Um, we already have at least one air filter in each classroom. Some already have two, like special education classrooms. Um, and then we'll continue to work with our labor partners to identify additional mitigation strategies as necessary. Um, we also want everyone to be respected, so we want to um, make sure that people really regardless of whether they decide to wear a mask or not wear a mask to be safeguarded from harassment, intimidation, or bullying for their decision to do so. Um, and so as I mentioned before, it will be um, become voluntary as of Monday, um, but we are highly recommending it as is also highly recommended by CDPH. Um, and so thank you. Trustee Rosco, do we have any speakers to this item? We do. So we have 15 speakers under this item. Should, so we, read, should we read the resolution first, or should we just uh, offer speakers? 
I think she, she, did she cover the I dirt for the okay. major part. Okay, yeah. great. So I'm going to be calling three people at a time. So if you can please just line up, that would be great. Uh, we have Marisol Gutierrez, I believe, uh, um, along with Blake Gallic and Megan uh, Bridget. All right, hello, my name is Blake Gallick. I'm born and raised in Santa Cruz. I have three kids that go to school right now and I'm speaking to you as a father. Um, all of you guys are wearing masks pretty much for the most part. They don't work. I know you're a doctor and they say that they work, but I know for a fact my kids have never been more sick this year than any other year that they've gone to school. Not only that, but it's affecting their mental health. It's affecting their social health. It's really bad what we're doing to our kids right now. And you guys need to take a look at yourself as human beings and look at your decisions that you're making for these kids right now. It's horrible. I think we, it's been two years now. It's been a, enough time that we've given these kids. I mean, there's no reason for them to wear a mask. And we're on a slippery slope of where we're going as a society. You know, if we keep going on the slippery slope and we continue down this route, we're going to be doing uh, vaccines that are mandated for these kids. I mean, we don't have any idea what we're talking about. This is not study. This is not, there is no science behind longevity of studies of what this could do to our children. I mean, we could be affecting our youth for generations to come. So I'm up here defending right now. Thank you. I'm up here to speak for my children and all the parents' children that I've talked to that agree with me and they say it's ridiculous and that our kids should not be subjected to this mask for any reason. It's horrible what's going on. They're sick, they're, they're getting sick anyways. They're, what happened to the flu? I mean, we don't even talk about the flu. You, I mean, the, the percentage of the rate on their survival rate is crazy. I mean, if there are people dying on the street and if there are people full of the hospitals right now, I could understand I'd have a mask on right now, but that's not the case. This has been like, almost like a show. And this last few months has been a joke and I think that we're all out of the COVID completely and we need to move on and get away from the mask and mandates. I mean, let's go back to a free society where we have our choices, right? It's ridiculous what's going on and I'm very disappointed in every one of you guys for any of you that make that decision. Um, hello, my name is Megan. Um, and I've emailed, I'm sure. Megan, I'm sorry, hold oh. hold one yeah. second. I don't want that beeping to interfere with what you're saying. You can start, I'm sorry. Um, I've emailed you all and talking about the mask mandates, the vaccine mandates, everything. And what I get from you guys is basically all schools in California, both public and private, are obligated by law to follow the mandates established by the CDPH. So let me ask you something. Um, can I see a show of hands that has seen the law passed by assembly in state signed by the governor, which requires you to follow the CDPH guidelines? Anybody? Anybody? And why don't I see anybody's hands? Because you know what, there is no law. There's no law. There, nobody has signed anything stating that these children have to follow these guidelines. And, but you know what is law is California Education Code section 49005.A3 A3 that states educational providers shall not do any of the following. Use physical restraint techniques that obstruct a pupil's respiratory airway or impairs pupil's breathing or respiratory capacities, including techniques, techniques in which the staff member places pressure on pupil's back, places um, his or her body weight against any pupil. So what you guys are allowing the teachers to do is malpractice. It's practicing medicine. Do you guys realize that? It is a medical device, is a mask, and by telling these teachers that they are allowed to tell kids to put their masks up and I realize yes it's going away but after it reaches a certain point we all know what your guys' intentions are is to put the mask back on the kids and we're here to say it's not going to happen yeah. it's not going to happen <laughs> by law you cannot tell these kids that they they have to do this there's no law so Thank we're you. done we're done
Uh, it's Mari Sol here. All right, so we have, next we have Herman, followed by Caroline West and Elizabeth Thorne. I'm a little nervous, so uh, please don't be too harsh on me, everyone. Mm. <laughs> Good evening, members of the board. My name is Herman Rafael Gonzalez, ASB co-president of Watsonville High School. I mention this all because apparently to adults, titles are important. I come here today to speak to you all about the abysmal state that our schools are in with regards to masking. Once again, reiterating to everyone that the resolution that is to be voted on tonight is with regards to strongly recommending masking and not to requiring masking as per the state of California. So all of you in the audience disgusted that the PVSD is to mandate masking, don't worry, they are not, you can go home. The entirety of the resolution that is to be read tonight at some point recognizes that not only is masking a simple and effective way for our students and staff to protect themselves, but also to ensure long-term protection as the science has shown. I have seen the insanely long lines spanning from our nurse's office almost to our cafeteria, a line of over 150 feet, and yes, I did measure. I have been in classrooms, freshman classrooms, with only 10 students in it because everyone was out with COVID. In fact, I even quarantined in fear because I am immunocompromised the full 10 days because I caught COVID while at school. I promise you all, not requiring masking creates a decision that cannot be changed within a minimum of two weeks, the time in, be in between board meetings. And I understand that you are following CDPH guidelines and that is commendable. However, I promise you all that in a pandemic as fast moving as this one, two weeks is far too short a time. As such, I implore you all to go further with a lot of precaution. I implore you all to take all of this into account, and when the time comes for another wave to rip through our community, infecting our children, you make the quick decision to mandate masks with a sort of quick trigger mindset and prevent the spread of COVID-19, protecting our community even possibly faster than the state mandates. Thank you. Okay, that, that seriously, everybody, we're going to be respectful to differing viewpoints. <laughs> Excuse me. Okay. We're, we're going to be um, respectful to differing viewpoints, and we're not going to be heckling or bullying people for coming up and expressing a viewpoint that is differ different than yours. And if we can't please play by those rules, I will recess the meeting. So if you'd like to speak tonight, I would ask you to be respectful of other people's opinions. Deep breath. Hi, I'm Carolyn West. Um, hello, Dr. Rodriguez, President of Serpa, trustees. It's great to speak in front of you all. Um, I basically, what he said, <laughs> um, I'm a school nurse, and so this is my life. I'm, I'm not speaking theoretically. I'm not speaking metaphorically. I'm not any of that. This is what I do every day, all day, every day. The science does support masks. And I, I'm bothered by people criticizing a student that comes up and speaks because they're saying, we're here for our kids. Well, he's one of our kids. So, so just, mm. And I, I know that we're going to have to go with the CDPH guidelines. I, I understand that. I think that I support that people choosing to wear masks if they want to. Um, I have autoimmune condition, so I have to be really careful with things. I work with a lot of students with special needs, and I do respect that. Um, I also agree that we'll need, need to be able to, to pivot and respond very quickly when things change. I'm in touch with uh, public health like daily, talking to them daily. They do expect another surge. It's going to happen again, most likely after spring break, because <laughs> um, that seems to be the waves of things. So I, I just want to say that I, I, I wish we could be a little bit more um, not, not aggressive, but assertive with this. I, I think we could continue with the masks. I wear a mask all the time. I've never had any kids complain about wearing masks. I never hear anything about this. I've been a nurse for 28 years. I've worn masks off and on throughout my life. I'm still alive. 
I haven't had any brain damage as far as I know. And so I, oh, <laughs> so <laughs> um, I just want to say that I do support, I support the resolution, um, but I also support that if things change that we can pivot very quickly. Thank you. Do we have Elizabeth Thorne? Um, and then after Elizabeth, we're going to have Damon, followed by Kristen Hurley. Hello, all. It's so nice to see your smiling faces above the masks. I know they're there. Anyway, I am Elizabeth. You know I am a school nurse. So the thing that I want to mention is I agree. I am going forward with the CDPH guidelines. Thank you very much. That has always been our stand. I would like to see just a variety of sizes of N95s, Dr. Rodriguez, instead of just the one size fits all, because it isn't one size fits all. So if you could get small, medium, and larges for my teachers. I have teachers who are immunocompromised, as you have heard that the nurse that came before me, the student that came before me. These people who are teachers in the classroom that are also immunocompromised, they don't have a choice. They can't teach from home. So they're going to be in a classroom at Watsonville High in front of a kid, kids without masks for two hours. This is a concern. I have had teachers tell me, because I'm also the union rep for Watsonville High, that they are going to go out on medical leave. I have one pregnant teacher who is seven months along. If she catches COVID while she gives birth, they will take her baby away from her until she gets COVID over. Her doctor's already told her this. I have kids, I have had kids who have told me that they are very afraid of coming to school. So we're gonna see a drop in attendance. Maybe not a lot, but, but we will. I think that it is respectful to be kind to everyone, to be kind that everyone gets to be able to say. So some of the teachers at Watsonville High have had conversations with their students to say, I want to stay here and teach you. I want to teach you, but I'm going to need you to wear masks in order for me to stay in the classroom. Is, it, are you okay with that? If you're not okay with that, that's okay too, but then I can't stay in the classroom. This, these are the things that I'm concerned about. That's just kindness. That's just kindness and respect. You don't... Thank you. So, uh, good evening. My name is Damon Hancock. I'm a concerned parent. Sorry, I got a whole bunch of stuff here. Uh, just want to bring your attention. I know you folks are aware of the resolution itself and how it reads is what I'm concerned about. There's two different points. Uh, page two of the resolution uh, states under the final therefore, if you read down the second to the last therefore, it says all staff, students, familiar, uh, families will not be strongly, I'm sorry, will not only be strongly encouraged to wear masks, but will also be safeguarded from harassment, intimidation, bullying for doing so. Um, I, I don't think that this resolution should ignore uh, anyone regardless of face covering. So harassment, intimidation, bullying should not be occurring or permitted regardless if a person is wearing or not wearing a face covering. Uh, second point is uh, the resolution, the body of information that um, Ms. Rodriguez put together says that they're following California Department of Education, Cal OSHA, CDC, local public health orders at Santa Cruz County Health, and also obviously the governor's orders. So my expectation is that you folks will contact your teachers, your uh, individuals that have direct contact with the kids, and you will make sure that they are adhering to the law, which is the fact that this is now, as of what we were saying Monday, it is voluntary so that there will not be repercussions for our children should they or should they not choose to wear a mask on their own volition. And likewise, uh, failing to follow this order like requiring face masks in the face of that is unlawful and they could face repercussions leading all the way up to you folks. 
So, wow, that stops. I'm going to call the other two speakers after her. So we have D followed by Elizabeth McCollum. Okay, ready, set, go. Uh, okay, I'm going to read from this paper. I have my hand. But first, I wanted to address the couple of people that just spoke before me, the student, I didn't catch your name, and the couple of nurses. You said yourself that half your classmates were out with COVID over the last couple of months. Does that lead you to possibly consider the fact that the masks don't work? <laughs> I don't know. And I, furthermore, for the nurses that spoke, has anyone outside looked outside our little California bubble to most other states in the nation where there are unmasked, I'm trying to speak to the crowd here, there are unmasked kids and teachers and community members, you name it, running around like normal. Our rates in California are, look no different than any other state in and out of COVID surges and unsurges and whatever. You cannot show that other states have done phenomenally worse than California because we're all masked up here. The data suggests that there's absolutely no reason to wear masks. So you health care providers should look outside our little sphere here and consider that. Okay, back to my point at hand. The, um, this is a cease and desist letter that I know you guys received, Pajaro District. Um, this was written. Tracy Henderson, representing Santa Cruz County Parents United, the cease and desist letter was sent to Ferris Sabah, um, to your district, a couple other districts, and a couple other private schools in the county. And I just wanted to let you guys know, if you haven't read it personally, you should read it. Because in this letter cites a lot of laws that are being broken and have been broken. And Megan pointed out some of those. They're this guy, these mandates are non-binding. Oh, I'm up. I encourage you guys to read this. I'm going to send it to you guys tomorrow. Thank you. Hi. Um, first time here. I don't really know to, where to start with, with all the conversations. I really respect everyone's take on masks, um, whether to wear them or not. I'm wearing them today. Um, I have a, a child at school that I'm concerned about. He complains about not being able to breathe with a mask on at school. These kids aren't wearing them properly. Most of us are not wearing them properly, even me. Um, even double masks, these masks, if they're not fitted properly, you're not fitted for them properly, they do not work. I don't care what everyone says. So the nurse, if, if she doesn't have her, her a mask fitted, it's not doing anything for you. It may be helping some, but it's really not doing what it should be doing. So you cannot force people to wear masks that are not working for them properly that are going to help everybody from contracting COVID. Um, not only that, we're building up bacteria in our masks if we're using them, our kids using them. What are we doing to our children? If we're going to have respiratory issues, oh, does anyone bring that up? No. Okay. Test your mask. I want you to test your mask. Does anyone have to re reuse a mask? I want you guys to see what kind of bacteria you are growing in those masks, okay? Um, I respect everyone that wants to use a mask. Go for it. Please do so. But consider, if you're in a classroom, in here, we're wearing, some of us wearing masks, some of us not. I'm wearing a mask. You're talking to me. Doing a droplet. Can you come in my eye? Can I not contact that way? So masks are one thing, yes, use them if you feel comfortable. Use eye protection if you feel comfortable. Do whatever is comfortable to you, but you cannot force another person to do what is not comfortable or is not safe for them to do because you decide, hey, you need to do this, you need to do this. No, it's our choice. You cannot take that away from us as you have been these past two years. Our kids' lives are being ruined. <laughs> I have a seven-year-old who's all like, he's just not enjoying his childhood because of your requirements. 
next after Elizabeth, we're going to have um, Tom Conway followed by Jose Rodriguez. Is the time we're going to start? Um, no, we're waiting for Elizabeth. You'll be going after her. So oh, give okay. me one second, okay? Thank you. Yes. It's okay. Thank you. Hi, everybody. So I'm taking a little tact. I just handed you some criminal documents. And these have been filed in federal court. Um, I, one of these I sent as a proposed criminal indictment to our DA, Roselle. Um, basically, the tact that I'm taking tonight is based on these documents because most people and most people in this room don't realize the lies that the pandemic is based on. So if anyone would like to see the criminal proof it's, it's actually shocking. It's, it's shocking that most people will never know. I gave some to the, the student here. He will know. There's irrefutable criminal evidence here that this is based on crimes. So everything that we talk about here, from masks to jabs to distancing to everything, is based on lies. So before you fall asleep, Mr. Dodge, I really encourage you to read these documents because if you do, you'll understand uh, really the truth and what's happening and that the decisions you're taking are from crimes that are being committed at the level of the California government and the federal government. Yes, and I'm happy to provide my email to anyone who would like to see these documents. Um, so, so basically, your policies and your actions have been in, in agreement with the crimes, and I, I, don't, I, I don't even think you know. That's why I'm giving these to you and why the DA Roselle has them. That's why the superintendent has them. That's why Gail Newell has them. Every single city council member has them. So everyone now is sitting on the crimes. Okay? So, so basically, what I'm asking you to do is to read those and then make your policy decisions based upon the truth and inform everyone of the truth. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so we have, uh, next up we have Jose Rodriguez followed by Tom Conway. Uh, good afternoon, guys. Uh, well, I mean, first of all, I'd like to thank you guys for trying to, you know, keep this peaceful because you know, a lot of communities all over the country, all over the world, as you guys can see, we've been very dis you know, divisive. And you know, I'm completely pro-choice. You know, wear a mask if you want a mask, but as you can see walking in every Walmart and every Costco, a lot of the times you don't have that option. You know what I mean? So for the people you know, trying to you know, push masks on us, you know, y'all gotta you know, uh, keep in mind that we've had uh, quite a bit past couple two years and we've been threatened with our jobs, you know, because of the vaccines now, you know what I mean? So, I mean, I get it, you know, uh, you know, we should just be like really pro-choice, you know what I mean? Wear the mask if you want to, and maybe we should recommend going to school with a hazmat suit, you know what I mean? Because, I mean, none of us are six feet apart, you know, if we're really concerned about, you know, germs, I mean, you know, maybe we should really close down the schools again because, I mean, we're all, you know, sharing the same germs in this room. You know, so maybe that's one thing you guys could recommend is a hazmat suit or double gloves, an extra pair of clothes going to school. But, you know, uh, you know, we should all keep in mind in this room that we should always keep the peace. But, you know, um, a lot of us haven't had an option because of these uh, fascist rules, you know, especially with these, you know, vaccines, you know what I mean? Um, but yeah, we know, uh, I'm pretty sure a lot of us in here, we're all against fascism, you know what I mean? Everybody. So, uh, yeah, I mean, but yeah, keep it an option. Maybe a hazmat suit, I don't know, whatever you guys think, but we are sharing the same uh, germs in here. But uh, yeah, I appreciate you guys uh, trying to keep the peace, though. You know what I mean? We really need more peace around every community, you know what I mean? And 
we should respect each other on our decisions. You know, what I mean, because as you can see, there's a lot of you know divisiveness out here. We really need to come together, bro. Like, you know, what I mean, no matter who, it is, you know. But thank you guys for keeping the peace. Yeah. So we have Tom. So after Tom, we have uh, Shana, followed by Mark Morris. Hello. Um, I. I would just like to speak out against the recommendations for masking children because um, I was a teacher and I saw kids wear masks and they really didn't like it. And I think that is signaling something that they're not right for children. The CDC had to um, lower the requ speech requirements for children and that is a signal that they're not developing correctly with masks and w when you're using any countermeasure for any illness, you have to ask what is the cost of this? And that hasn't been correctly done because the authorities setting these rules are entirely corrupt. And as long as we continue to obey their guidances, you'll be embodying their hypocrisy. Yep. And I think one thing that we can all look at is that um, this nation and this world is under the spell of materialism and we need to recognize that we have a spirit and a soul and that to continue on with these ineffective measures is just signaling failure and that if you really wanted to help people not get sick there's plenty of things you can do but forcing people to do things is not the way health and public goods work I think there's so many good things we can do and it requires an ongoing conversation rather than people getting mad at each other. Because I think, like Jose said, we're all in this together. And I think it's good if we all put our hearts together instead of getting up in arms. Thank you. Set the clock. Okay. Give me one second, OK? There we go. Superintendent Rodriguez and trustees, my name is Shanna Krigger, and I am a pissed off Rio Del Mar parent. I want to put into words the frustration, the anger, and the sadness I have over your failure to put our kids first during the past two years. From sending teachers on summer vacation and abandoning our children in March of 2020 to 100% distance learning in the fall, which was a total joke, to the colossal colossal failure in April of 2021 when you made a mockery of this district with one and a half hours of in-person instruction, the lowest in the entire state of California. Your poor decisions have made one thing clear. Students are not your priority. Being led by Nellie and her union minions has been detrimental to the educational and emotional well-being of all school children in PBUSD. <laughs> Mandating masks for kids is delusional and it's dangerous. There is zero evidence that masks in classroom do anything at all to slow the spread. It's been cited in numerous reports the risk of kids getting COVID is astonishingly low and those who do get it bounce back quickly. According to the CDC, COVID deaths in ages 0 to 7 are 0 0.009 of total deaths. So stop pretending that you're protecting the kids. Stop pandering to the union. Masking children has detrimental impacts on communication in the classroom and attributes to high anxiety among the kids, not to mention the bogus mandate has turned kids into mask police, which is absolutely heartbreaking. Keeping unproven measures in place is no longer justifiable. Now's a chance to finally put kids first, take away the mask mandates full stop. Your jobs are on the line because if San Francisco can do it, we can do it Thank too. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have Mark? And then after Mark, um, we will have Chris Webb and Marilyn Garrett. Garrett. Hey, good evening, everyone. My name's Mark. Uh, I was born right here in this hospital, born and raised 40 years ago. Um, I'm a father of two young children, and history will look back on what we've done to our kids and not be kind. 
the suicide rates, the rates of depression, kids fearing the fresh air that they breathe outside, the untold consequences of what we're doing do not justify the small, minuscule, minute, trivial benefit of wearing a mask. I was a firefighter in this district for 10 years. I was trained in uh, you know, dealing with airborne viruses and disease. We would wear a full face respirator or an N100 because those are the only tools effective to stop a virus completely. And you had to be fit tested and properly fitted with a shaven face. And not only then, it wouldn't work. You had to have sizes for every person. The science does not back up what we're doing to our kids. If you've seen a kid made to run a track with a mask on like we've done, kids are running in PE classes, dropping of heat exhaustion because they can't breathe because we're so afraid to grow a spine and say enough is enough. Well, enough is enough. We've suffered through this. This is the 2019 virus. It's 2022. The information is here. It's not the beginning. We know. The best peer-reviewed studies say that masks are 90% ineffective. And on little kids who touch their face and pull them and snotty nose, they're not effective whatsoever. My kid takes a break and eats snacks indoors without his mask. Then they put it back on. Then they take a nap without it on. It's asinine. Everyone knows it. What we're doing is child abuse. And to continue it any longer, it's enough. Enough is enough. Um, I want to thank Board President DeSerpa for the strength of her leadership at the last meeting and enforcing the mask mandate. And to the district for having required masks for so long, I credit that measure for allowing me to go through this entire uh, pandemic having never contracted the virus. I have teacher friends in other states, in other cities, and they've shared a lot of uh, anti-mask sentiment. And I'm not surprised when I hear that they did get COVID. So I, I feel to that extent, my anecdotal experience reflects that masks do work. When early in the pandemic, I remember reading about other states like Kansas and how um, counties with mass mandates had lower case rates, lower deaths. So again, I want to thank the district for protecting um, the students, protecting the teachers. I have unvaccinated children at home. I really appreciate that I wasn't um, unduly harmed in the workplace and sent home to infect my kids. I also want to uh, just say that I really don't appreciate saying that distance learning was a vacation. It, I, can't, I can't tell you how much it was not a vacation. Um, having to retool and everything. It, and also, um, it, it kind of messed with people's work-life balances. Um, so th that's, that's just um, really speaks to me. Um, the other thing, I just want to say I support the resolution. Um, I feel like to the extent that kids may, I haven't had any kids at, at Renaissance complain about the mask. I'd almost never have to remind anyone. I've seen kids in gym, they don't, they're, they're not complaining. Um, I go to the gym, I lift with the kids. I don't even have to take off my mask because of strain. Um, I, I don't know, maybe some people are just, uh, I, I don't know, it's, if, to, the to the extent that people's kids are like affected, I suspect it's coming from the parents. So, the black kids aren't complaining. And uh, some kids, some kids have less anxiety because of the mask because that's another Thank way you, Chris. for them to kind of. Thank you. Uh, Marilyn, you're up. Marilyn Garrett. I taught in this district for about 20 years. We had a group farm without harm, trying to stop the poisoning from the pesticides, from the toxic agriculture. We don't hear anything about that anymore. Nobody's getting sick from pesticides or cancer, are they? It's only COVID. Anyway, 
I want to recommend this trifold, and I don't have, I only have one in front of me. It's titled Myths and Truths About COVID 19 Contagious Virus, question mark, or 5G microwave technology. On the back, COVID 19 and the 5G connection. In here, it includes what's in the shops people are getting and comments on masks. And here's a myth. Masks and lockdowns have helped prevent disease and death. Truth, this is what some people have said, states that have not required masking and lockdowns have had the same or lower rates of disease and death compared to those that have required masking and lockdowns. Hmm, it goes on. Myth, wearing a mask can protect you against COVID. Truth, more than a dozen credible medical studies prove that face masks do not work even in hospital settings. Even if COVID-19 were caused by a virus, which it is not, it's never been isolated, the pores on the recommended masks are larger than any virus. Myth. Wearing a mask poses no danger of truth. Analysis of face masks worn by children found 11 dangerous pathogens, bacteria that produce poisons under conditions of low oxygen on the mask. Masks Thank you, Marilyn. Also Time's up. Reduce, let me finish the sentence. Oxygen levels leading to headaches reduce. So immunity. everyone gets two minutes, Hypoxia and we're going to be respectful of that. So cells. thank you. WestonAprize.org. Um, so those are all the speakers for this item. Okay. Are there any any discussion from the board? Hi, Trustee Schaffer. <laughs> I would just like to make one suggestion um, in our therefore that we just change the wording, the very last therefore, to um, be safeguarded from harassment, intimidation, or bullying regardless of mask choice. So I'd like to make that suggestion. Other than that, I will make a motion to approve this resolution. Okay, we have a motion on the floor. We need a second first, and then you can have comment after the second. I'll second. Okay, um, continued discussion. Yes, Trustee Soto, you are up. Man. Um, you know, I initially voted against the mask mandate when it was first proposed. I was a sole vote. Um, I got to say, it's interesting to hear the comment and the facts brought forward by the public. Um, I'm kind of a cynic when it comes to this, or not kind of, I am a cynic. Um, I do research, I follow up on different stuff, I don't follow mainstream. Um, there are a lot of facts and information out there that shows that you know, these things are useless. Um, I, I wear it in good measure here because I've been asked to. Um, believe me, I'm hard-headed. I don't listen well, but I'm doing it. Um, but as you can see, I have it down right now. Uh, I gotta say, I support the resolution on two things. The fact that it gives you a choice, number one, and thanks to Sh uh, Trustee Shocker's um, updated verbiage on that, therefore, is the second reason. You know, um, there is going to be a lot of backlash possibly next week. You know, everybody's got a different opinion. Um, but that being said, you know, we had a situation here last week, or not last week, last meeting, um, where there was some disagreement. But we can agree to disagree. But at the same time, we got to coexist. We can't be divisive. We have to respect everybody's space. If, if you believe in little green men from Mars or your God, or if you believe, you know, 
Jesus Christ is your God. That's your choice. But don't force it or push it upon other people. You know? Um, so, so thank you, everybody, and uh, you know, make your choice next week. I have a conflict of interest with this resolution. Um, I appreciate the work the superintendent and the agenda setting committee have done in bringing forward a resolution that recognizes the importance of continued caution. I think that this addresses best practices while acknowledging the limitations of our authority. As a trustee, I think it is our best option at this point. Um, my conflict comes from the fact that I also represent thousands of nurses as a member of the California Nurses Association Board of Directors. In that capacity, we have been advocating for operating under precautionary principles for years. As much as we would all like this pandemic to be over, it isn't, not yet. Our healthcare system continues to be impacted, and those who work in it are simply exhausted. To vote yes, you know, or, or no would be to abrogate my responsibilities to one organization or another. And I cannot, I cannot ethically do that. For those reasons, I will be abstaining as the only way I can see of honoring both sets of commitments. Thank you. Um, so for me, if I may, yes. um, so I understand there's really strong opinions on both sides of this issue and, um, you know, I respect uh, both perspectives. One of the things that I also, um, as I was reading this resolution and, uh, you know, I highlighted even when we, um, we were reviewing it as the agenda setting was the fact um, that, uh, you know, that bullying will not be tolerated. So I also agree uh, with the comment that the gentleman brought forward about ensuring that that's made clear. Because um, again, our priority are the kids, right? And so I don't want them to be bullied whether they choose to wear a mask in the classroom or not. Um, so, um, so I will be supporting um, this resolution moving forward with that amendment as well. Thank you. Are there any comments, Daniel? I also support Trustee's motion to include her wordage, but I also just wanted to ask, how will bullying intimidation be defined? Have we thought about that yet? Or you know, if we can look into that. So there is technical answers to that. Um, and so specifically bullying is when and so it's the same definition that we use when we're doing bullying with children, but um, bullying specifically is when someone of power or perceived power, whether it's status or um, title, it could also be st students, right? Students can have additional status over someone else and they exert that authority generally in repeated ways, so more than one time. Um, that specifically is the definition of bullying and so that will be the definition that we continue to use. Um, intimidation includes, is really, we also have definition for that specifically. It's, it's an ed code of what intimidation is, but specifically it's someone is being told that something of neg generally negative force will occur to them if they don't comply. And so um, that's the definition, the simple definitions of intimidation and bullying. Thank you. Uh, Trustee Acosta. Thank you. Um, so I just really, I want to clarify that, I, and I appreciate you adding that language because I was already thinking the same thought that was something I was struggling with with this on both sides. Um, so that language, Eva, just to clarify the readback on that for Trustee Shocker's amendment to this resolution, it will read, therefore all staff, students, and families will not only be strongly encouraged to wear masks, but will also be safeguarded from harassment, intimidation, or bullying for said... For regardless of mask for regardless of mass choice. Is that correct? Okay. Um, so thank you for making that amendment because that was something that I was struggling with when I read this and thank you, um, Trustee Orozco, for seconding that. Um, and I, I would agree that um, I want to emphasize that this is essentially creating a choice at this point, right? And it is also a choice that can be ripped 
back, not based on any decision by this board, based on what I had heard you in some of the whereas with CDPH, right, and the Santa Cruz County Health Department, right? That could be stripped back away from this board without a say. You don't even have to bring it back to the board. Is that correct? Yeah, so there are specific on ramps which they are talking about. So if they if we get to certain matrix, it wouldn't happen as a district, it would most likely happen school by school based on case rates. Okay. Um, and so we try to be transparent. That is um, if you read the law, that is one of the one of the things that's in there regarding mitigation strategies. And um, so what we're doing is that will be on Santa Cruz County Public Health would be the one that would mandate that and then mandate the timeline for that. So that wouldn't necessarily um, be a PVUSD selection nor the board selection. Correct, okay. And, and I just want to thank for that clarification again and that as well. And then also to follow back up on what Trustee Dodge Jr. was just asking about the harassment, intimidation and bullying on both sides of the coin of this. Right, for choice. Yeah, I was going to word it a little bit differently than you guys had just because I think it makes sense to put um, regardless of um, regardless of choice um, towards the front. Um, and so have it say, and regardless of choice will also be safeguarded from harassment, intimidation, and bullying for doing so. I think it reads better that way. Um, so therefore all stu staff, students, and families, we'll, regardless we'll, of choice. We'll be, re we'll be strongly encouraged to wear a mask and regardless of um, choice, mask choice, will be safeguarded from harassment, intimidation, and bullying for doing so. Okay, so that may sound like you may need to bring that back to Trustee Shocker and Orozco to prove that change in the verbiage, which okay. um, still sounds good by me. My follow-up to what Trustee Dodge Jr. asked, and I, and I get what we have with regards to our bullying policies in state ed code with intimidation, um, what will be the protocol for following through with that should, and again, this says, all staff, students, and families. Mm -hmm. So that includes our employees as well mm -hmm. as students, right, and families. So what um, protocol will be followed should something arise to a site administrator or someone to the district So level? we will follow progressive discipline like we do for all cases. And that would be brought forth most likely in a closed session, correct? No. Um, progressive discipline doesn't get brought to the board unless it's for suspension oh. or right. or removal. That's so right. it wouldn't be brought to the board. We, unfortunately, there we have staff <laughs> that receives progressive discipline that Never doesn't gets, necessarily right. reach the board. Okay, I, I guess it's just making sure that um, we're having some assurance as a board that there there is the follow through. But thank you yeah. for your clarification on all that. Yeah. Okay, are there any more? Yeah, oh, I was Jen? just gonna say, I, I'm okay with the clarification of the change. Marilyn? Point of order. Marilyn, no, we can't answer that. Point of order. So, okay, Jen. Dr. Rodriguez, I am okay with having the verbiage placed at the front so that the resolution reads that they're protected regardless of mask choice. And so you're, are you amending your your motion? I am motion? amending my, okay. my first motion. Yeah. Okay. And then I'm yes. amending your second. My second. Okay. We have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Anyone abstaining? I'm abstaining. Okay. So the motion passes six, zero, one. Thank you. Okay, next we move to item 6.1, a public hearing to dedicate a permanent easement right to improve the overall safety around Lakeview Middle School. This is a report, this is a public hearing led by our CBO, Clint Rucker.
Test? Okay. Good evening, President De Serpa, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. Uh, tonight I have for you at a public hearing, um, you may remember at our last board meeting, we did talk about granting the permanent easement rights to Caltrans, who is working with Santa Cruz County in order to improve the uh, highway area near Hubahan and College Road. Um, what we have now tonight is a public hearing, so the public can see the district's intent to grant easement rights. After this public hearing, we will vote um, whether or not to pass, pass the resolution. At the last board meeting, it was brought up to ensure that the sidewalk was um, maintained by Trustee Acosta. So I did work with the uh, Santa Cruz County to not only review their plans, but to take it a step further and actually ask that in their proposal, they included that they would maintain the sidewalk. So the first piece I want to show you is just this blue highlight. Now, a little odd because the last maps we have were facing up or north, what I would see for the sidewalk. That sidewalk, though, is across um, what is highlighted in blue, is the sidewalk they will be putting in front of Lakeview. So it is showing that the sidewalk is in their plans and is to be maintained. But because I really wanted to make sure that, um, Trustee Acosta, your concern was addressed, I did ask that in their proposal, they also put in that the sidewalk would either remain or would be um, replaced. So if we can bring up the other item on the agenda, which would be... Uh, yep, easement contract. As we scroll down, you'll see one section highlighted in yellow, which says replace or remain existing sidewalk on the corner of College Road and Highway 52. So again, the permanent easement that we're offering is 93 square feet on the corner of College Road and Highway 152. So we're not offering any additional um, space. It's just that 93 square feet, and they will be maintaining that sidewalk by either not by either maintaining it or replacing it. And again, it's both shown in the plans and in their proposal uh, to the board. So with that, that uh, ends the public hearing on my part, unless the board has any questions or we have public speakers. We do have one speaker. Okay. We have Chris Webb. Oh, oh okay. And no speakers. To this okay, item. so we had um, quite a report the last board meeting. I'm not sure any of our board members have further questions. I'm gonna look around. Anyone have further questions? No, okay. I, I just wanted to say thank you for that added bit in writing. Thank you. Absolutely. So I think that concludes our public hearing. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll be hearing about it a little later. Uh, next, we have visitor non-agenda items. This is item 7.1, public comment. Okay. So we have a total of eight speakers for this item. We're going to start with Caroline West, followed by um, Herman and Elizabeth Thorne. Hello again. Um, I was actually asked to speak um, for on behalf of a parent, um, a very special parent who contacted me. Um, she wasn't able to come to the board meeting because. Um, uh, she has a child that's one-to-one -one care and who's immunocompromised, and she was concerned about coming to the board meeting, especially as we expected that there would kind of be the, what happened. Um, her concern that she's expressing, and I'm just uh, sharing this, I don't have a, an opinion necessarily, is that there is uh, there was a raise um, given to the nurses, um, to the certificated staff, and then particularly those inside of self selpa that that will be and then there'll be the higher on bonus which will be addressed later on uh, she has a one-to-one uh, -one, um, nurse with her child who's in post-secondary so i think and she uh, this nurse is through an agency and i guess she is concerned about this nurse being um, equitably um, reimbursed also so she asked me to um, represent her for this um, I do have to say I am familiar with this nurse, and he is most excellent. <laughs> um, I wish he was ours and not through an agency. <laughs> so what I did tell her that I would share that she does have a great concern because he's an excellent caregiver, and she is worried that he will be um, wooed away elsewhere. Uh, that's all I had to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
am I good? Perfect. Yep. I just wanted to speak really quickly and really briefly on something kind of unrelated to tonight, but something that has definitely been demonstrated tonight. And that is that in the coming years, uh, one of the graduation requirements for high schools will be an ethnic studies class. I've always thought that being exposed to more diversity, more different perspectives, people from different cultural backgrounds always, always, always results and begets diversity and accepting in one's own mind and for others. And I just would like to say that I hope when the time comes for, I know there's ethnic study classes at Watson High School. I'm super, super grateful for that. And I've heard that those classes are amazing. Uh, I just hope that when the time comes for ethnic studies to be a graduation requirement that there is proper support in order to facilitate those ideas of accepting other people's perspectives understanding diversity, understanding other people's perspectives in order for us to be able to have more mature conversations because while I can disagree with people in the audience and while I can disagree with board members, of course, I still respect everyone and I still demonstrate that respect through my understanding that they're a person with their own you know, right to speak out and they don't deserve to be yelled at or criticized or insulted simply because they have a different perspective. And I just hope that when the time comes for those classes to become a requirement, that there is a lot of support, a lot of care, and just a lot of love put into that so that we can have a more understanding and even more understanding and an even more supportive community. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Elizabeth Horn. All right, and then after her, we'll have Bill Beecher followed by Marilyn Garrett. Hello, board again. You're gonna get tired of seeing my face, and I'm sorry. There's a few items that I'm speaking on. One of them tonight is I wanna be clear about the intimidation and bullying that was in the last item that was mentioned. Just because, as I had mentioned, teachers asking and encouraging students to wear their mask, I hope that does not qualify under intimidation and bullying. But by the definitions that were read, it could be because they would be considered in a position of power. It does put teachers in a very interesting situation. And so please address that. Consider having the board ask Dr. Rodriguez to address that to provide more clarity. Because what is the difference between encouraging and bullying and intimidation? Okay? So please be clear. And the other thing is, is Again, I want those N95 masks in different sizes, <laughs> okay? <laughs> because I, the ones that I were given, I couldn't wear. They were way too small, so I had to buy my own, and I know a lot of teachers have had to buy their own. Anyway, um, thank you for all the hard work. This is very, very hard work, and I recognize it as being very hard work that you guys are doing. I very much appreciate all that you guys are doing. So I wanted the opportunity to say thank you. I also wanted to say, We've got another round of negotiations going up, as you well know, and everything's gonna be on the table, as you well know. You know that we're gonna be asking for more money for raises. It's very expensive to live around here. And some of the people in the uh, contract only got a $2,000 raise, some got a $4,000 raise. In the survey that was sent out, there was no differentiating that one group should get less money than the other group. And so with that in mind, I have had feedback that it should have been 4,000 for everybody kind of thing instead of 2,000 for one group and 4,000 for another. And that's all I have to say on that subject. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, at some past board meetings, I was frightened by discussion about how radiation is destroying our children in the classroom. And so, are our schools safe from radiation? Well, I'm a scientist, so I said, gee, I can look at this from a scientific standpoint. If only this worked. I did, and it's on. So why don't you click, okay. so. Wi-Fi and cellular use has exploded over the last 20 years. Well, if there's a correlation, then brain, breast, and testicular cancer should have shot up through the roof. So, next slide. 
So let's look at the data. Next slide. Here's brain cancer over the last 20 years. If anything, it's going down. Next slide, thank you. Breast cancer, flat. Next slide. Here's testicular cancer, it's flat. So yes, we are safe and it's based on real data. Nothing changed. If, if we'd had a major problem with radiation from cellular phones, then we should have seen people dying by the droves, more than COVID-19, because we have so many cell phones and Wi-Fi, it would have been obvious. Next slide, please. There was some earlier cancer attributed to analog phones, and they were because the digital has much lower power, one-tenth the power that an analog does, so they saw some. Teenage breast cancer was seen because the girls were putting their phones in their bras. And thank you. I think you can all sleep well tonight. I'm sure the lady behind me can sleep better tonight. Uh, next up we have uh, Marilyn Garrett followed by Pan Pam Sexton and Chris Webb. Lots of false statements there. Um, I recommend some books. One is called The Invisible Rainbow, A History of Electricity and Life by Arthur Furstenberg. And he puts out newsletters and that is, uh, has such documentation of the adverse effects of electricity and wireless radiation. Uh, I highly recommend it. His website is cellphonetaskforce.org or info at Cell Phone Task Force. Over the last couple of years, he's put out newsletters, and I'm going to excerpt just one. This is frequently asked questions on wireless technology. My cell phone does not make me sick. Why should I stop using it? Your cell phone is damaging your health, whether you are aware of it or not. It is damaging your blood-brain barrier, the barrier that keeps bacteria, viruses, and toxic chemicals out of your brain tissue, the barrier that maintains the inside of your head at a constant pressure, preventing you from having a stroke. Since brain tissue has no pain receptors, Plenty of damage can occur without pain. Instead, it will cause memory loss, difficulty concentrating, anxiety, depression, sleep disorders, and so forth. In rats, damage to the blood-brain barrier can be detected after just a two-minute exposure to a cell phone. After a two-hour exposure, the damage is permanent. There is no reason for it to be different in humans. The radiation from your cell phone is also slowing your metabolism, your ability to digest sugars, fats, and proteins. Thank you, Marilyn. This causes either, let me finish the sentence, obesity or weight loss, depending on Thank your genetic you. makeup, causes diabetes, heart disease, and cancer. Wireless technology is the cause Marilyn, of Marilyn, I need Marilyn you to respect obesity. the time. Thank okay. you. Please check out cellphonetaskforce.org. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Um, you uh, know, there is a button you could push the podium down, if I think. Is oh, it there? <laughs> I can barely I, see you over. I'm so <laughs> That's um, okay. I, that's Maybe okay. I don't even need that. Well, um, you do because we're, we're broadcasting. Oh, so okay. The people at home want to hear what <laughs> Sorry, you have to I'm say. Sorry, I'm so short. That's okay. Um, I'm proud of being short. But um, I, so, I, oh, and I'm losing time. So no, I'm. No, it's okay. We'll give you, give you I'm back. Sorry. Um, and I'm a little bit nervous, too. I, um, I've spoken to you before, and I'm Pam. I'm a parent of two teens, uh, an educator in the district. 
And I um, am a community member, activist in various local organizations, including one called Surge, which is showing up for racial justice. And I want to second the, um, the student's remark about really hoping that the district will um, make it a graduation requirement, having ethnic studies. I think, um, and it, right? it was evident today that that... It already is. Oh, it already is. Yeah. Oh, it, <laughs> that's yeah. great. We were like the first in the whole county to... That's to wonderful. Yeah, implement. That's really wonderful. Okay, thank you. I, I knew that it was here. So I guess what I want to say is I want to see it expanded because my understanding is it's just at the high school level classes, but um, to have it expanded to the middle schools... That would be great. And the other point I want to make is I know there was a, a situation recently at the um, high school where a student was arrested. Um, I, <coughs> I know that it was a situation that needed intervention. And I'm, I'm just a little bit concerned with um, some board members, one unfortunately who's not here to hear this, uh, cheering the arrest. Because for me, the arrest is a sign of a real big problem. And while we can cheer the intervention, we need to think, so what's, what's happening now? This was a 14-year-old, and, and I don't know the whole situation, but somebody, but this, the concern that this could be um, terrible for their future and that, yeah. that school-to-prison pipeline. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. And we are implementing ethnic studies. It's already implemented, I think, at the middle school level. Okay. Yeah. Um, I want to first express my appreciation to uh, Lisa Garia and Claudia Monharis and anyone else who works in this building who subbed in a classroom at any point during the COVID era. I have great respect for that kind of teamwork. And I firmly believe we can deliver better outcomes for our students and staff if we uh, have more people in leadership positions getting into the classroom and, and seeing what it is. I, I think we should modify our administrative positions to have to require uh, administrators to teach one class during the day. Um, one thing I'm I'm noticing is sometimes people in leadership they lose touch with some of the realities of the classroom and the delicate balance that exists in maintaining relationships with the students while also upholding school norms and challenging students academically. Sometimes it's, it's easy to have that good relationship as a support staff when, when you're not really having to push students in the same way you would as a teacher. I also want to thank Dr. Rodriguez. I know you also subbed, um, so thank you for that. I, I think it's a very good example that we we're setting here. I wanted to request that the green team consider um, allowing uh, teachers or any staff to plug in their uh, plug-in electric vehicles at site facilities. Uh, and when I first got to Renaissance years ago, there was a, a teacher who had a plug-in and he couldn't, he was prohibited from that. And then that meant he was driving a very large truck all the other days. And for multiple reasons, I feel like we should do that. The other thing I want to request is that we survey the staff uh, and assess the implementation of our restorative practices framework to make sure we're really doing the best we can and we're improving it um, every step of the way. And I make, capitalizing on the, the professional expertise of our teachers. So thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Chris. Anyone else? Okay. And that concludes our um, visitor non-agenda items. Uh, next up is our employee organizations. This is item 8.1, PVFT. Hi, I'm Nellie. Um, president of the PVFT. I think you've heard about me earlier. Um, <laughs> So we're here in this district to advocate for our students through our the adults that we represent. And so you've heard me say that before, that when we bargain, we bargain with our students at heart. 
Um, and safety is one of the bargaining areas um, that we address, and it ha was, has been the most um, important uh, the last couple of years. And here we are at pretty much the cusp of the second of the two-year anniversary. So um, I want to thank uh, you for passing the resolution. I believe I, the um, amendment to it, um, the, the edit to it was, I think, a really good edit. I want to thank Dr. Rodriguez for agreeing to include um, the labor partners uh, in the resolution because we all work together to address, um, you know, to work together. <laughs> That's what we do. We work together to um, move our students through their educational career. And it's, you know, and it's our professional career to do that. Um, so thank you for that. And then yeah, there are a couple of items um, on this agenda as well that um, will come up with uh, for memorandums to offer an added incentive to new hires. We do hope that along with the um, recent uh, agreement for the increase to our salary, that it will be helpful to um, attract some people to our district because we are in desperate need of teachers. Um, the areas of, of serious need have been classroom teachers and then our um, school nurses. So we have the, um, so thank you to the district for agreeing to address the need for filling the vacancies that we have in our school nurse um, positions. Um, you know, the health and safety of our students, again, still continues. Um, our school nurses not only, um, well, they address all of the students in our district, uh, but they also um, test students in SELPA and our special ed um, services, and they attend IEP meetings. So their service is, um, is, is as important as everybody else's, but they have a very large caseload. And so having more nurses is important. Um, they don't just put Band-Aids on. Um, and, uh, and so that, that's the thank you on, on all, all the um, items that we have on the agenda for tonight. Um, and I want to um, also thank this board. I know you've heard me speak to community schools in the past, and so um, Dr. Rodriguez has let me know that we are um, able to sit down and have that conversation. We don't wanna leave money on the table um, from the state. Um, I know that uh, in this next couple of years, so we have already heard it mentioned that you know we will be going into an actual contract negotiation cycle um, in this coming year. So what we just negotiated with a, was a reopener for the very last year of our three-year contract. So now we move forward um, with a slightly improved salary schedule, um, but we have now uh, the next three years contract, and every year we talk about total compensation, but then there are other articles in our in our contract that we address because there's always needed improvements to um, to our learning environments and our students our working environment is our students learning environment another another slogan you hear many teachers unions say so um, thank you and um, have a great evening <laughs> are there any speakers Bill Beecher, didn't forget about you, Bill. <laughs> Good evening again. I'd like to thank the teachers in PVFT for the academic performance in our previous COVID-19 online year. Many districts' performance dropped, dropped badly. Ours did not, so thank you. And if you go through all the SARC data that you've seen before, you'd see that. Of course, this was not a group, this was a group effort with the district who supplied the academic direction under Dr. Rodriguez and Lisa and the fantastic IT support from Dan. It was a true team effort. I think that we learned that you can do online education effectively. Perhaps we could use this today to backfill the classrooms that do not have teachers. The lessons are there from last year. Why not use them? Work with the district to use these existing online lessons to help our students. After all, it's all about providing an effective education for our students. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. 
Do we have any representatives tonight from CSEA? Okay, anybody here from PAVAM? No? Oh, Veronica, great, hi. So Veronica, I understand you're the principal of Alianza, and you're speaking on behalf of Pajaro Valley Association of Managers. Thank you. Um, so good evening, President DeSerpa, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. My name is Veronica Aguilar, proud principal of the Alianza Armadillos. Tonight I'm here to represent PVM and PVUSD's amazing charter schools. A message from our principal of the Chameleons, WCSA, Amy Thomas. Our Chameleons at WCSA are getting ready for our seventh annual invention convention being judged this weekend. Science camp for sixth and seventh grade students and our eighth grade trip to Washington DC and New York City is well on its way. We're also thrilled to bring back our art auction on March 19th with a Hollywood theme at the Portuguese Hall. WCSA is thrilled to be piloting Playworks to begin the transition into a safer and more inclusive recess time. It is just fabulous at the Chameleon House. Stop by to visit anytime. At Alianza, our armadillos are hard at work. Our amazing science teachers and students have just completed the invention convention. All the winners will represent Alianza at the California State Invention Convention virtually. We have fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade students all going. We're also excited to report we recently co-hosted Family Art Night with the Art Council of Santa Cruz County. Students, families were able to enjoy a night full of art activities, dancing folklorico with Ruby Vasquez, visual arts activities, storytelling, and music and singing. Lastly, on March 2nd, we hosted Read Across America. Students were able to bring their PJs to school and their favorite book. All classrooms had reading activities throughout the day. They highlighted the importance of reading. In addition, during lunch, we gave away books and bookmarks to all students to take home. Alansa staff and teachers are excited to be able to engage all students and families in fun learning experiences. And truly, it's been a great year to be an armadillo. Thank you and have a good evening. Thank you for that positive report. We're moving on now to our action items. This is 9.1 resolution. We did that one. I'm sorry, we did that one. 9.2, this is a resolution 21, 22, 28 to dedicate the permanent easement rights to improve the overall safety around Lakeview Middle School. Thank you, President DeSerpa, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. As I presented a few moments ago at the public hearing, this is again a follow-up to our resolution where we declared an intent to grant permanent easement rights. This is now the board's opportunity to grant those easement rights to the project that again is dedicated to improving traffic and overall safety on the uh, Houlihan Road as well as uh, 152 College Road at that intersection there. So. I am happy to answer any questions the board might have, and I would recommend we approve this resolution to improve the safety around that school. Okay. Do we have any further speakers to this item? No, we do okay. not. Okay. I'm looking for a motion to approve. I'll move to I'd approve. like to make a motion to approve, President Trustee. I'll Hall. second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank, Thank you. you, Clint. Item 9.3, approve a resolution 2122. I can't read without my glasses. 32, acknowledging Governor Newsom's executive order N 3 22. Hi. Hi. Good evening, President DeSerpa, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. Um, I am presenting executive order N 3 22. So on January 11th, 2022, the governor issued executive order N-3-22 providing staffing flexibility measures to address staffing needs for in-person instruction. The flexibility measures authorized by the executive order include, but are not limited to, suspending requirements that substitute teachers have um, on file with the California teaching, credential, teaching credentialing prior to the issue of a temporary certificate, extending substitute service 
to not more than 120 days, suspending requirements that student teachers be under the direct supervision of a credential teacher, and providing incentives for CalSTRS retirees to return to classroom service. The PVUSD school district finds that staffing flexibility measures specified in Executive Order N-3-22 greatly, have greatly assisted instructional programs operated under my auspices to provide in-person services to students despite the staffing shortages caused by the Omicron-driven rise in COVID cases. It's the recommendation of the district staff that the board approves this resolution for Executive Order N-3-22. So. I don't know if I need to read the whole thing. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Saxon. Sure. Are there any speakers to this item? We have no speakers. And any comments or discussion from the board? I'll make a motion to approve. Okay, I'll second. Um, so in a nutshell, this will improve our ability to use substitute teachers. Correct, yeah. So we, um, it allows us to get substitutes into the classroom quicker. Uh, allows them to stay longer and then allows our retired teachers to mm -hmm. work longer um, without affecting their STRS retirement. And more quickly, I hope. Because don't they have to be out of the, uh, yes, off the job quickly. for they like no longer have a to year. wait the six months. Six they months. They be back immediately the day after they retire. That's which great. some of them have done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Right. Thank you very Thank much. You. Okay, our CBO is up again. Clint Rucker will be presenting our 2021-2022 second interim report. And this is a budget issue. Thank you once again, President DeSerpa, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. Yes, for tonight, for tonight I have for you our uh, second interim report. I'll go ahead and jump right in. So. Firstly, just once again, talking a little bit about uh, what the second interim is. I'm gonna note there's a small error that says 2021 on there that should say 2122. Colleen was supposed to catch it, but she did put a lot of work into preparing second interim. So I'm gonna let her slide on it, but I actually do wanna take that moment to thank Colleen for all the work she puts into this because while I do get to come up and present and talk about our budget and go through it and audit it, um, she does put a lot of work and so does her staff. So I just wanna say thank you to her and her staff for all the hard work they do put into the budget before it's presented to board. Um, with that, this is an update on our actuals from July 1st to January 31st. So as we present second interim, we're able to show you what we have spent, which gives us a good idea of what we think we'll spend in the final months of the year. It also includes the assumptions from February 1st to January, June 30th, which also includes the governor, governor's proposal. That has a little asterisk by it because one thing we do when we build out our budget is we get what we call the common message from the Santa Cruz County Office of Education. All the county offices in the state work together to review the governor's proposed budget, look at the COLA that's been proposed by the Department of Finance as well as by school services, and then they work together to give us a recommendation on how we should make assumptions. So what COLA we should use, how we view ADA, all of those pieces. It'll be very important later, so I'll get to that. Um, and then lastly, it's an update from really 21-22, the first interim that was approved um, back in December. So what is it not? It's not a new proposed budget. This is not asking the board to make a change or change our priorities mid-year. This is really an update on what was already approved back in June. It's also not a forecast based on future economic situations. So we hear a lot of times things come out, we hear there's gonna be new more new money for this or that. If we haven't seen it in a actual proposal from the governor that's not in his January budget update, typically you will not see it in second interim because we're not making forecasts based on what we think could happen or what we hear is coming out of um, the Department of Finance or the Legislative Analyst Office where they're making assumptions. And then lastly, it's not a roadmap to identify our future reductions. Again, it's not a new budget. It's an update on the budget that was already approved. So what do we see new in second interim? So as many of you have seen, we do have a 5.33 COLA now being proposed for 22-23. That's actually an increase of about 2.8 from what it was, uh, what you saw at first interim prior to the January budget update. We also see about a 0.5% increase in COLA in 23-24. So great news in that sense, we are seeing COLA increases in both of the out years at this time. Um, we're also seeing a 5.33 COLA for special ed, which is great. A lot of times special ed, 
gets part of the cola. They don't always get that full cola that we see in general fund. Um, it is great news that they are getting it because as we all know, special education is severely underfunded. We also, uh, in your second term, you will see the inclusion of PVFT's ongoing uh, increase. As you heard uh, mentioned by Nelly, we did settle with PVFT and we will be bringing that to a future board meeting. So we did include that in our second interim assumptions of what that will cost uh, for the out years. Um, average daily attendance, you can actually see a decrease. So every district around California is seeing almost an 8% decrease in ADA. We're actually only seeing about a 5% from normal but every district is seeing a severe decrease in ADA. That impacts our funding in the out years because we see a, a lower ADA this year. And as you may recall from our January budget update, we do use typically the prior year's ADA for funding for the current year. And then ELLP funding, we have seen that come through. That is included for uh, next year as well as the following year. That's that program um, you may all remember. It was the Expanded Learning Opportunities Program. That is an expansion of the Expanded Learning Opportunities Grant that we all saw as one-time money. So what do we see from school services currently on the dartboard? You can see that COLA coming out uh, in 22, 23, and 23, 24. Um, CalSTRS, I wanna just make a quick note. You'll see that it's, status, it's static at 19.1%. That's because every year, STRS actually does their, um, looks at their books, they look at their how their stock market's effectively doing, and they create their new rate each year. Typically, STRS is required to not increase more than 1%. We typically see it increase about 1%. However, it's, we don't make estimates on it because they are purely based on their actuarials that they get once they um, look at their finances. CalPERS, on the other hand, does t typically do it through the out years, so we do see an increase in CalPERS, a pretty significant one in 22-23. So what do our multi-year projections look like? So at first interim, um, we actually see an increase in our um, fund balance for 21-22. A lot of that goes to the fact of either whether it's unfilled vacancies or additional one-time funds that we weren't able to spend this year that we'll be planning on spending next year. Um, you'll see also in 22-23, that net increase or decrease in that fund balance actually goes up quite a bit. As I had mentioned uh, in the prior board meeting, as we negotiate and we see that COLA, we do see a lot of loss from declining enrollment, as well as that new ADA hit, as I told you, about a 5% drop. Um, this also, and I'll get to it in a little bit, does not include the governor's new ADA proposal. So this is, again, a multi-year without that proposal that the governor currently has in January. And then 23, 24, you see we get additional COLA and it does decrease that fund balance, uh, that deficit spending we're seeing, it goes down to about 3 million. One thing this does highlight is as we spend that one-time money that we knew we had that was a large amount, but it was only one time, we do see that that somewhat, it's not a large, but a structural deficit still there. We do need to address that as we move forward in the outgoing years. Contributions, so these are our contributions to other funds. So from our general fund unrestricted, so our least restrictive dollars, where we have to contribute to actually ensure that the other funds that we support are able to uh, support their expenditures. What I want to highlight is we do have that $1 million we put into deferred maintenance for this year. Again, it's not in the out years. It's currently only in 21-22. If this is something we want to see going forward, that would be something we would bring in June to the new budget. We also see, uh, you'll see a slight increase in child development. You might wonder why we're now funding child development when in the past we haven't. As you know, we looked at kept child development salary schedules, we did want to improve those. The only way to do that and for them to be able to afford it was actually to help contribute from our general fund to some of their increase that was negotiated with PVFT. With that being said, you notice that it drops down in 23-24. As programs like Angelica's Migrant Seasonal Head Start is able to apply for additional funding showing what their costs are, we do anticipate that they'll be able to absorb some of those costs, but there is going to be a contribution from the general fund to ensure that those teachers can get paid more of a livable wage. So what about our deficit spending? So again, it, it looks a little tough in 22, 23. However, if you look back to where we were at 17, 18, we were at almost $16 million in deficit spending. So we've worked diligently to reduce positions, reduce contracts, to be able to reduce down that deficit spending. So in 2021, as well as this year, we had no deficit spending. We actually saw an increase to our fund balance. U utilizing some of that one-time money was able to help us in terms of not seeing that deficit spending. 
We're seeing a bit of a jump back up in 22, 23, but then it drops back down in 23, 24. 22, 23, and 23, 24, they're projections at this point. A lot can change between now and June, especially with the May revision of the governor's budget. However, I do just want to remind the board, this is something we want to continue to look at, continue to right size as we see declining enrollment impact this district. So what challenges have we faced this year? So um, as we're developing our budget, some of the things we've continued to see is declining enrollment still really impacts this district in a negative way. The 21-22 ADA, our average daily attendance, that's where I noted we're down about 5%. So although we're getting a larger COLA next year, with the current proposal from the governor and the current common message from the COE, we have to use what is currently in law, which says we either use our ADA from prior year or current year, whichever is higher. The problem is with having such low ADA this year, next year our projections don't say we'll use this year's ADA. We'll actually use next year's, which means not only are we use, we are, we'll be using hopefully a higher ADA, but a lower enrollment. So it does impact our finances quite a bit. We still see increases to health and welfare benefits, and then, as I noted before, that increase to PERS, kind of a big one in 22, 23, but then also the increases to SERS that are unforeseen at this point. So I want to talk a little bit about declining enrollment. I know I've shown you a slide before. I've shown you the dip in students, but I think it was important to show really what does it mean for our district as a whole when we see this kind of a declining enrollment hitting us all at once. So remember, we've been held harmless for two years. So we're going to see two years of decline in one year in 22, 23, unless the governor does approve that ADA proposal. I ran the numbers multiple times, really wanted to ensure they're correct, but it's true, based on our, on our ADA drop down to 91% roughly, as well as our decrease in enrollment, we lose almost $15 million. The following year, we lose, now again, this isn't cumulative, we're down about 15.5 million. So in, in the span of what we saw this year to two years out, we'll have $15.5 million less in revenue. Now, you'll look at the multi-year and say, but Clint, the revenue is actually going up in that third year. It's more than it is. Correct. That's those two colors compounding. And those two colors are barely making up for the fact that we lost so much ADA. So really hoping that we see something from that, uh, from the governor's budget in May that confirms he will be doing something with ADA. Even if he does, we still see that shortfall from our ADA this year. That 91, 92% we're hoping to end at is gonna follow us now for three years if he does approve that approach, proposal. So again, what's not in our second interim, as I noted, average daily attendance. So the common message that the COE sent out, as I noted, what they encouraged districts to use for their assumptions, told us that we actually had to continue to follow state law. So state law for average daily attendance says you either use the greater of last year or this year. So that is what our second interim is currently based on. So if you look at it and say, I thought the ADA would provide us some relief, it doesn't look like it is, it's not currently in second interim. So I don't want the board to be surprised if by June we throw out a new budget for 22, 23 and you say, wow, your deficit spending suddenly is much lower or you have a lot more revenues than you anticipated. How were you off so much? We are already aware that that number could fluctuate based on what the governor approves. The LAO is actually at the moment proposing a higher cost of living, a higher COLA than is currently in the governor's budget. However, once again, that's an estimate from LAO. We can't include that in our second interim as it's not part of the common message. And then the governor has also proposed additional TK funding on top of the kind of planning grant you've seen or the initial TK funding he proposed. There's been talk of additional funding coming out. As I noted in that first slide, second interim is not a time to make forecasts based on what we think will happen or what dollars we anticipate coming in through the May revise or potentially in the out years. So that is not currently in second interim. So we may see some additional dollars for our TK funding. So I wanna talk a little bit more about that ADA cliff solution. So once again, the proposal out there is using average ADA based on 1920, 2021, and 21 So the prior three years would be our ADA funding for the next year. You can see currently, if we use current law, which our second interim is based on, we're at about 15,414 ADA. That would be our average daily attendance for that. This does not include our charter schools. This is our general fund unrestricted only. 
However, with the governor's proposal, it would be 16,081. So it's a change of about 667 students that we would be funded on. So you can see it's quite a bit of a change. It's almost 5% increase. It's around 5%. So that's a huge change in our revenue if you take into account that we could be funded on 5% more students. Just want to have the board kind of see that. See that, again, if we come to June and you see a difference in that revenue, this is going to be the biggest place it's going to come from. And as I noted in a prior board meeting, and I won't talk too much about it this time, but I really hope that we see a better solution than is actually currently proposed in the budget. I don't think this addresses the problem long term, nor does I think it, nor do I think it addresses the problem even for next year because of the ADA shortage we're seeing right now due to COVID-19. So what are the kind of, kind of the big takeaways the board should walk away with second room and say, what did I learn? I know a lot of times I hear follow-up questions on, on the pieces. So I wanted to kind of try and get ahead of it, give you guys some takeaways to walk away with. Um, one is we see an increased revenues due to COLA. However, we see that revenue decline due to the ADA decrease. So we're seeing an increase of COLA, but if you look at it and say, you know, Clint, we got 2.5% more COLA roughly. How did our revenue not go up 2.5%? because our ADA went down from first interim. So we're seeing, a, we're seeing a drop there. The variation in expenditures between 21-22 and 22-23. So you'll see a big jump, and you might look at it in certificated salaries and say, are we really filling that many more positions? Are we hiring that many more individuals? It's not about the salaries increasing because of hiring many more. It's really the unfilled vacancies in the current year as well as including that tentative agreement in the out year. So you start to see that impact. We have one-time money that we can help fund that agreement for this year, but in the out years, it really will fall into our general fund. So that's where you'll see it. We're also seeing an expiration of one-time funds. So we're seeing that in 22, 23, as well as 23, 24, some of that one-time money that we had that was offsetting expenditures or allowing us to per have higher purchasing power, things for our facilities, the 30 million that the board graciously approved to improve our facilities, that money will be running out. So that one-time money is starting to dwindle away when we look at the out years. The ADA proposal, and I know I'm hammering it on the head, really hitting this one hard, but it's not in this current budget because, again, the common message stated that we need to use current law, not the proposal. And really expect many changes with Governor's May revision. We typically see changes to our June budget from second interim based on what we see in the May revision. In this one, I, in, I expect to see great changes because if, if nothing else, that ADA solution. So with all of that being said, where are we at second room? We are positive. So again, three different types of uh, certification types. We have positive, qualified, and negative. We are positive, so we do expect to be able to meet our obligations throughout the next current year, plus two. And what are our final steps? So in April, I mentioned at January's budget update, there's a few different calculations used to determine what the COLA actually is. Those calculations are typically finalized in April. That's when we get what's called the statutory COLA, which is what's required by law to be put into the budget. Typically, we do not see the governor put in less than COLA. We did see it. You may all remember in 2019 when COVID hit, he did put in much less than was the statutory COLA. This year, um, I expect to see that, that finalized COLA in uh, April will most likely reflect what we see in the May revised budget. And then that May revised budget, we'll see um, from the governor, typically around May 15th, we'll see an update from Governor Newsom on what he thinks actually the budget will look like after working with Assembly and working with Senate. And then June, you'll see the 22-23 budget. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, we do have a speaker to this item, mm -hmm. Chris Webb. I know there's um, the hiring bonuses to offer to new teachers, and um, I'm here to say that there's there's savings in retaining, and and that means respecting the teachers that you have, and uh, part of this comes out of there was a there was an incident in my site, and it basically kind of reflected that that perhaps we're not as restorative as we could be, and so I I would posit that. If we maintain principles like equity, accountability, transparency, clear expectations, stakeholder involvement, if we think back to when Renaissance has done this best, 
and take elements of, of that program, we can do a better job of retaining our, our teachers. And I'm saying this partly because one of the, the teachers who felt uh, a major affront, they, they're thinking, even after the raise news, they're thinking of leaving. And this is a teacher who's, who's known for their experience with restorative practices. So I'm, I'm thinking that we need to learn from, from what we've done best. And I'm also, I saw the ADA numbers and 1920, that was the best year for ADA, not counting the distance learning year, it's a little weird. Uh, but 1920, that was our old system. Part of the old system that, that worked so well was we had after school program in person. And that was a chance to recover ADA. So part, we, to do that, we need transportation to come back. We need um, to offer EWRs for staff that were willing to do that or hire out to have that. And um, also that would be another chance for us, if we have our field restored again, we can bring in some more revenue. I know, um, I said this before, but I know a local rugby team, they, they practice at Cabrillo. Yeah, I could get them to go to Renaissance. I could get the students to join up and have a really enriching time. But these are, these are some ways I feel like we need to capitalize on, on our strengths. And also we need a language other than an English teacher. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, any discussion or questions from the board members? I do. Just Jen Hall. Um, first, thank you for a very, very clear presentation. And I know particularly with the issue around ADA, that's, you know, having a the governor and the legislature come up with a plan that actually works for schools is so important. And, you know, I have, as many of my constituents and teachers and, and such have been emailing me and I've been urging people to contact their legislators and it's like, I hold to that principle as well. You know, it's like I and I believe uh, Trustee Shocker, uh, she and I will be involved in some meetings with Senator Laird and uh, Assembly Members Mark Stone and, and uh, Assembly Member uh, Robert Rivas urging, you know, for funding that works for our schools. So for, for the public, for anyone else, it's like definitely please, you know, keep that pressure on so that we can do what we want to do with our schools. Yeah. <laughs> Trustee Dodge. Just quickly, uh, I would like to ask this board if we could look into passing a resolution, um, the, which was bought by Senator Nancy Skinner, Senate Bill 878, Road to Success. It would establish a state-funded program to ensure that every TK through 12 public school student in California gets transportation to and from school each day. I think that would probably help out as Teacher Webb was saying. Um, you know, I, I've brought this up before and uh, I just wanted to kind of touch up on again. Have we been able to narrow down what schools are being affected most by declining enrollment? I know at, you know, listening to people on the ground, I know Watson High School is filled out to the max and they are being sent to PV, but have we, you know, we talk about declining enrollment, and I know you, you know better than I do, but do we see what areas are being affected the most, what schools are being affected the most? So we, we see it really district-wide. When looking at the percentage drops at each school, it's pretty, it's pretty steady. What we do see that throws it off, for example, at the high schools, you'll see a bubble. So you'll see a lot of students exiting middle school, going into high school, which then sees more declining enrollment at the middle schools because we don't see as large of a sixth grade class coming into the middle schools. Do we have any examples of those schools? Um, for example, Lakeview. Lakeview got hit very, very hard with their bubble uh, last year. They saw quite a few students move up into ninth grade. They did not see as many students come into sixth grade. I'm more than happy to provide the board with the information, though we do have a demographer who looks at trends, looks at our intros, so I'd be more than happy to provide detailed information. Yeah. But overall, we see declining enrollment across the district. What you tend to see in the trends is whether it's elementary losing a, a lot, so a few years back, three or four years, we saw elementary lose quite a bit because that bubble moved into middle school. So you have a large number of students who move in, and then that bubble moves up and finally moves into high school. I think that'd be great so we all can have a chance to see, because otherwise declining enrollment, declining enrollment, but it might be different for me than it might be for 
trustee, you know, Shocker, you know, I'm sure Acosta, you know, Lakeview, and it might be different in trustee the surface area, trustee Sotos, and so I, I think we might would like to have a look at that, so thank you. Trustee Shocker. I just have a question. I know we're kind of waiting on things, but um, we had opened enrollment for TK. Do we foresee possibly gating some students from the changes with TK going on? Hopefully. <laughs> I'll, I'll let Dr. Rodriguez speak to this. This is a tough one because we also see additional funding specifically for those students that needs to be spent on those students, but I'll let her speak more to it. Well, I think when it comes to students, we hope so. So what's going to happen is um, TK is going to be expanded by months across the years, right? So it's not every month. But I, I think we do hope that we have additional TK students that come in, which will then, we will just get them earlier. I don't know if it will help us totally in the long run, um, but they, we will have one more year with them. Um, we definitely are seeing declining enrollment at the kinder level. And currently, which, you know, I think some of the things that we're working towards is going to help that. Currently, we have significant parents who do not take advantage of TK. They do not take advantage of it. Um, and so it's for a myriad of reasons, but um, one of them is, you know, they they just prefer to have a full day program, and so be, and they can't get to a child midday, um, and so we typically have very very low TK numbers, and then that causes us to have to do um, TK kinder combos, which aren't necessarily bad, um, but um, because we have such low numbers, so I think we're trying to do two things. One, we will expand the number of students that can enter in the program. Program, but two, we're trying to continuously um, brand it and help people see the benefits of going into TK because it is a pretty small number, unfortunately, for us. Trustee Roscoe. So just a follow-up to that. Um, so TK, like full-day TK, is only offered at certain schools, right? Mm -hmm. well, currently, we do not have any full-day TK oh, classrooms. There was at least two for some reason. Um, we have what's called um, expanded, um, expanded day, um, but I, I would not call it full day, no. Okay, is there a goal to move in that direction? Well, we're working through a demand to bargain on kindergarten, um, and so um, we're working towards a pilot, so we'll bring that to you once we finalize it. Okay, Yeah. thank you. I think that, um, I'm sorry, did you have another question? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. No, it's okay. Just going back to um, enrollment and ADA and so forth, um, I know we used to have a program in place called Summer Academy a while back. Or S Saturday Academy? Saturday. Yeah, mm -hmm. Summer, yeah, Saturday Academy. Mm -hmm. um, are we looking to bring that back in the future? Or was it not proven to be as effective? No, it is, I think, that, and, and if, um, Ms. Chess wants to speak to it more as well. I think, so it requires people power yeah. in order to be able to do it. Um, and for, um, you know, this year has been challenging for people. And so um, asking people to work a Saturday was already challenging pre-pandemic. Um, so getting enough significant staff to do that um, during the pandemic um, we believed um, proved to be challenging. I think now that our positivity rate is down, um, and I'm hoping it will be after spring break as well, um, then um, we may have some staff that's um, willing to do it. Um, it definitely is, is something that we have not chosen to do partially purposefully, um, because whether it has to do with exposure notices and, yeah. and commingling of, of additional classes, um, 
but it is something that we need to return to, especially in the spring. And so that's why um, you heard Clint speak to, it's currently 91, possibly 92, right? We do think that with summer, um, or Saturday school, excuse me, summer we can't get credit for, um, but Saturday school, we could bring it up approximately a percent. And then I'll toss it over to you. <laughs> Check. Uh, yeah, so we were very conscious of the fact that we were co-mingling students, so we were very conscious that if we have seven periods and then we put them all together on Saturday, it is an increased risk. Uh, so we were a little bit cautious in terms of starting out. I will say that Watsonville High, within the last three weeks, has started a small rendition of seeing can we pull this off and, and do we have enough staff to do it as well. Um, so themselves, it does require an administrator on campus as well. So these are all kind of things that have come into play of um, manpower, as you will, or woman power, as you will. Um, in addition, um, we also have a small group that's talking about it currently at Rolling Hills, uh, but it really has been reliant heavily on the number of staff that are also willing uh, to, to be able to do that. Um, and we've been s very cautious, as you can imagine, just making sure that we're kind of rolling out slowly. but. There's definitely a need, um, and I will say both programs usually get a lot of kids when we do it. So uh, a lot of hope that we'll get them up and running soon. Okay. Because it doesn't necessarily have to be staff, or does it? For you as a staff specifically. Um, it needs to be have certificated staff okay. present, yes. Got it. I mean, it can, an administrator also needs to be present as well. Got it. Okay. I guess the, the only other thing I would just add is, um, you know, I'm glad to see that we're not doing layoffs and we're increasing salaries compared to other districts. And that's a good feeling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we have to think of ways to bring more kids into our district. <laughs> so maybe we just hire only people that are bringing kids with them from out of the area, <laughs> sell how great it is here on the Central Coast, near the ocean, in the sun, in the redwoods. More students definitely does increase revenue. Imp <laughs> improve access to fertility. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell me we, have one? <laughs> we have to think out of the box, Clint. Anyway, okay, I'd like to make a motion to approve the second interim. I'll second. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Any abstentions? Okay, the motion passes six zero. No, six one zero. zero. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is item 9.5, approval and memorandum of understanding between PVUSD and PVFT classroom teacher signing bonus 2022-2023. Yes. Hi. Thank you, President DeSerpa, Board of Trustees, Dr. Dr. Rodriguez. So I have an MOU signing bonus in front of you tonight for classroom teaching positions for the 22-23 school year. Um, so currently we have in the contract that we are we provide a $2,500 signing bonus for people with a math, science, or special ed credential. And so this MOU expands on that. So the expansion is that we are now offering a $2,500 bonus to any classroom teaching position. So whether you're teaching first grade, English at a high school, what have you, you will receive a $2,500 signing bonus. Where it compounds is if now you are also um, a classroom teacher in either math, science, or special education, your bonus would now be $5,000. And it goes even further as we've heard um, during the school year of how hard hit our high schools have been at PV and Watsonville. And so we wanna try to mitigate that as well. And so the bonus would further compound to another $2,500. So you could earn up to 75 or receive up to $7,500 if you are a math, science, um, or special ed teacher and you take a position at one of those two high schools. Um, as we have in the past, we've written language that also pays this out over a few years so that we can try to retain um, these people in our, in our positions longer. So you'll see it's being paid out the first half at the end of the first, excuse me, the end of the second semester of their first year and at the beginning, sorry, the beginning of second semester of the first year and the beginning of the second semester of the second year. 
um, so that, and they need to still be employed with us. So um, that is the MOU that we have in front of you. We worked with PVFT to develop it, and so we're happy to be able to put this out. We have a career fair, job fair this Saturday, so I'm really excited to put that out there, and so are the directors in HR, so I, I um, request that you please approve this MOU tonight. Any speakers? We do not have speakers to this item. Okay, any questions or comments from the board? Jen Shocker. I just wanna say um, thank you for adding the bonus for Watsonville and Pajaro Valley High. I know that they've been really hit over yeah. there. And I think um, it's important to get more teachers in the classroom to maintain equity mm -hmm. in our district. So um, I wholeheartedly support that extra bonus for bringing in teachers to those two schools. So I will make a motion to approve this MOU. And I'll second that motion. Any other comments? Okay, first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. This is item 9.6. Approve the memorandum of understanding between PVUSD and PVFT school nurse signing bonus 2022-2023. Report by Allison Nizawa. Yes. Thank you, President. The SERPA Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. So again, we have another MOU for you tonight for a signing bonus for our school nurses. Um, across the district, we have had a challenge hiring all positions and everything is important. Um, classroom positions were just before this, but school nurses have also been hit pretty hard and they have had quite a, um, a load th this year, especially coming out of COVID. And so we definitely um, want to fill out all of our positions and be able to retain um, this much needed position. So uh, I'm excited to bring this forward tonight too. Um, for your approval, so I um, request that you approve this MOU. Are there any speakers? We do. We have two um, speakers to this item. <laughs> so we have Carolyn West and then Elizabeth Thorne. <laughs> They're still here. Okay. Uh, hello, President Caserba. Oh, okay. Dr. Rodriguez, trustee members. Um, I just want to let you know today's my birthday. And I, I appreciate spending it with you. <laughs> but that, that, that is a measurement of how important this is to me, how important the issues were this evening that I wanted to be here. Um, obviously, I do support the sign-on bonus for more nurses. We really have been struggling. Um, we have uh, schools right now that do not have an assigned nurse, so we're all kind of covering and doing the best that we can right now. Um, it, it has been really hard. It's been hard to attract nurses. It's been hard to keep nurses. Um, there is a nursing shortage, so that's kind of a known thing. And school nursing is 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 really a specialty. It, it's all jokes aside, it's not all passing out band aids and all that. It, it does take. It's an unusual um, and in a unique setting. Um, it's not a medical setting. It takes a specific skill set and a willingness to, I guess, think out of the box. And that is a hard for a lot of different people. Um, I've been a school nurse for 14 years. I've been a, an RN for 28 years so so I have different areas that I've worked in um, I do fully support this I hope that you support this also um, I would like to ask though I, I noticed that there was the sign-on bonus and the, the um, earlier MOU in regards to the bilingual and I'm wondering if we can add that for the nurses because we don't we only have one bilingual nurse and I guess is that something to consider um, to attract more bilingual nurses because I, I really think our community deserves that to have more um, bilingual staff, bilingual um, nurses. Um, and thank you for hearing me, and, and thank you for sp spending my special day with me. <laughs> Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Yeah. No song? Just kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding. All right. Um, hello. Uh, I also want to thank PBFT, Nellie and Roddy, for bringing this up in the HR meeting or whenever you did, and thank you, Dr. Rodriguez and Allison, for putting it on the agenda. It is wonderful to see this. It would be nice to have a bilingual stipend, but really what I'd like to see as another incentive would be, there is an MOU with PVFT about funding um, the credential clearing for teachers, for SPED teachers. If that could be added, um, I am specifically looking for 
ways I can poach nurses from other districts. I didn't say that, did I? So, um, because it would be really great if we had them already trained. As Carolyn has already mentioned, this is a specialty that is the lowest paid specialty, although we have come a long way since I started 14 years ago, as did she. But we require the highest credentials for this specialty. You, you can be an, a hospital nurse with a two-year degree out of Cabrillo College. You need a four-year degree and one-year post-baccalaureate minimum, as you know, just as our teachers do, to be a school nurse. So I am very appreciative that you've put this on. Please consider also looking at funding the credential because that's a $10,000 thing. So that would be really something else that we could do. Um, Allison has just informed me of another district that may be having their nurses let go, and I'm going to reach out to them. So thank you, Allison. I appreciate that. And <laughs> because, you know, and, and, and Jennifer, if you know somebody in uh, Watsonville who would like to perhaps have a schedule such as ours and not work bedside anymore with everything that's going on, please, please reach out to them. I appreciate it. Any help we can get. And thank you so much. Please do approve this best, this one. Okay, any further discussion or yes. questions for yes. the board? Yes, Jen. Um, just that, you know, I, I, I have a really good sense of what y'all have been through this year, um, knowing from, you know, talking to my nurses at the bedside in the hospital and, you know, people, uh, school nurses and other, um, in other districts. And it's, it's been incredibly difficult. And I know what it's like to work short staffed when the circumstances, that's just the way it goes. And when it, what it feels like when it's like, okay, we need to have some hope in sight just to carry on, carry through the day. And so if this helps, you know, one, get us closer to the staffing that we've committed to, you know, great. And so I would, I would very much like to make the motion to approve this. Any further discussion? Danny? Uh, I just wanted to quite quickly say thank you, Elizabeth Thorne. Um, I've seen you in action in Watson High, the thousands of students. You, you, you deal with every day. And you, you work hard, you never complain, and you just roll up your sleeves, and you do it. So I just wanted to say thank you very much. I, I've seen you in action, and I just want to say thank you. Anyone else have a comment? Okay, Oscar. Thank you, Allison, for the information. I just have one question just regarding retention. I mean, we're offering this bonus. Is there anything stating that uh, as a condition you, you could stay on with, need to stay with the district for at least a year or something? I mean, just in case somebody signs or gets hired, gets the bonus, and six months later, you know, something better comes up. Is there anything? Uh, so specifying we, that. Sorry, I didn't mean to go. So that's what we can't write anything that they were they can't exit their contract. That's why we're trying to pay with this MOU and the last one. Why we're trying to pay it out at a certain point, point. Um, and you must still be employed. So the point is, is in January, if you're not employed with us because you left in October, you don't get anything. If you stay in only one year, you only get half. So we're trying to put those pieces in place too. It's, a, it's about as best as we can do because we can't require a multi-year contract. Okay, anyone else? We have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. This is item 9.7, Art of Education for Visual Art Teachers. Good evening. I was hoping there was going to be a step stool. Good evening, <laughs> Board President, you can push it down. Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. Um, I'm here tonight to talk to you about the art of education. Oh we um, started this program during the pandemic when we realized that we really needed an articulated program to go from K-12 for our teachers to provide high-quality instruction. Um, and you can see here some of the quotes from our teachers. They the ones that started with it fell in love with it. Um, what we found with this is that the, the um, curriculum is very flexible and can be used at all of our schools in various ways while providing quality standards-based content. 
Our teachers have everything they need in one program to provide high quality standards based curriculum that is always evolving to meet the needs of our students. There are culturally relevant curriculum added continuously and um, the, the representative from the company works with our teachers when a new um, lesson has been added to the curriculum. It, there's a, a, a screencastify that comes out and other things so that the teachers are aware of what, what is happening. Sorry. Um, our teachers have everything they need in one program. I'm sorry. I just danced for two hours. I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit tired. Um, there's a re robust PD piece that comes with this curriculum, which is part of what we really. I'm sorry, you guys. Going backwards. Oh, here we go. Sorry. There's a robust PD piece that goes with this. It's um, there is self-paced professional development that the teachers can watch on their own and there's videos that go with it along with um, videos with teachers teaching in the classroom so that they can look back at it and eventually we would like to put these into kick up um, the professional development platform that um, we're using in ACI um, the teachers get two full day workshops that comes with the program they can either do it on um, synchronously as it's happening or they're recorded and they can go back to doing it. Teachers can pay on extra if they want to get um, extra PD hours that would go towards their, you know, to move up a, a slot. So like I said, there's unlimited PD hours, but then they can pay if they want to get credit to, um, towards their step and column. Um, supporting ELs, uh, this is key to our demographic here in PVUSD. There's a curriculum that supports all English learn language learners and academic um, language that goes along to scaffold their language development. And we found that to be very, um, with combining that with, um, in elementary with our benchmark um, curriculum, it really provides the students, it's kind of front loading some of the academic language and or hitting again on in a second time for the students in a different modal modality. Um, this framework provides a scope and sequence that we can customize as time goes on. So as our teachers make lessons, they can put them into a bank for us um, to be able to go back to and, and use that lesson again. And, um, and it can be used um, as a tool to help provide professional development for new teachers as they come on to, to be able to do that. PVUSD Arts is committed to providing equitable learning opportunities to all students and quality arts programming. And this is a, a step to ensure that this is happening. Because of the high quality of this program, the access for growth of our teachers, we believe this will help the teacher retention and happiness in the classroom. Everybody likes to feel good when they're, when they're in their teaching and, and this provides us a way to be able to um, give them high quality program along with the professional development to back that up. And we want them to feel like, like they're happy about that. Um, all of our staff has, has seen this program. We had seven use it all year and they've all, they all want to do this. I did, um, I uploaded two quotes to board docs and I'm sorry about that. After I uploaded the first one, I didn't, I realized that um, I didn't have the one with the professional develop, the ongoing professional development for our teachers. So there are two quotes in there and, and but I do ask that you um, approve the quote for the, with including the professional development. Any questions? Any speakers to this one? We do not have any speakers. Okay, any um, discussion or questions from our board about this item? I'll move to approve. We have a motion, does anyone want a second? I'll second. second. We have a tie. <laughs> I think Jen Shocker won. 
We have a first and a second. I'd just like to say that um, as, as um, a longtime sitting board member, when we didn't have any art really in the school except for what teachers sort of cobbled together, this is um, a beautiful example of giving um, teachers and staff ideas about best practices and how to really front load um, learning um, using art for our ELLs, and I love it. Mm -hmm. So thanks for bringing this forward. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good evening again. Each year, PVUSD partners with other districts, the County Office of Ed, and Santa Cruz County Arts Council to provide arts integration workshop for teachers in the county. The Arts Integration Institute brings together K-12 teachers, teaching artists, and school administrators to promote academic achievement, e equity, and equal access through an in-depth learning of the arts. PVUSD offers 10 scholarships to the four-day wo uh, workshop. The approval of this contract is to provide the 10 scholarships for PVUSD staff again this summer. And I ask that you approve this item as well. Any speakers? By the Nine. way, this is um, item 9.8, the Summer Arts Integration Institute. So we have no speakers. Does any board member comments, Jen? I just had uh, one question. How are the 10 scholarship recipients selected? So we, we go by first come, first serve. Um, we have had more than 10 from our district before and they have accommodated them because we have been doing this for so long. So they have made, made sure that there was room for our teachers. Um, if it hasn't happened, but if it did, we would ask somebody who had attended the year prior to give up their slot, but that hasn't happened in the past. So okay. um, they've always accommodated us. Thank you. Are there any questions from the side of the table? Um, I have a question. How are we doing filling our um, art positions? Um, we're, well, we have two interviews on Friday, which mm -hmm. is wonderful for the high schools. Um, and both, uh, can I talk extraneously? Yeah. Okay. Um, we went to a conference in February and we interviewed, we had a booth there and we um, were, we, recruited a bunch of teachers, which has been wonderful. Two of them are interviewing on Friday with the site administrators. Um, both, I think, would be perfect fits. Um, so it's going very well for that. Um, we got a much a head start this year by doing that, and um, that, that's a great thing. We've done it in the past. Allison has um, supported us going um, to this convention to do that. So That's great. I love hearing that proactive work that we're doing. Mm -hmm. um, can Allison, I don't know, or maybe Sue, how many art teachers, not not counting music, but just like visual? So we have uh, 29 have? visual art teachers right now. Uh huh. And um, <laughs> <It's> <laughs> music crazy. Teach, I know we went from <laughs> 1.5 to 29. Yeah. Um, and um, uh, music teachers um, in the elementary, we have. Uh, seven, eight, eight in the elementary, and then four in the um, middle and middle, and, no, I'm sorry, we have more than that. Um, That's okay, I know you weren't prepared to answer this question. I know, but, um, yeah. you know, Starlight had 300 students, or 300 parents, sh families show up tonight, and I did a workshop, and I'm um, just a little, <laughs> we'll, we were we'll dancing for two yeah, hours. We can, we we'll can provide the back. number in the weekly effort. Yeah, yeah great. So. Anyway, it's a lot. Yeah. So that's great. So with, uh, I think, no further comments, do we have a first and a second yet? I don't think so. I'll move to approve. A second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Sue. <laughs> and thank you for doing the, st the starlight dancing tonight. My yeah, it's great. <laughs> Okay, item 9.9, .9, E-Rate Category 2 School Site Network Upgrades, presentation by our technology guru, Dan Weiser. Yes, thank you, Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. I'm back in March, as I am every year, bringing forward our E-Rate application. Um, E-Rate, as you know, is a federal program that helps us and other schools and libraries afford network infrastructure. We're fortunate to qualify at the highest discount rate, which is 85%, um, which allows us to keep 
the really the fastest and most robust network uh, across the entire district. But there's constantly a need to upgrade, uh, and so we're very fortunate that we get this funding source that keeps us using the, the latest and greatest in network infrastructure. So this application for this year uh, will support 28 school sites with uh, needed wired and wireless uh, equipment. Um, and this is the second year in the five-year funding cycle. So we still have three more years, and over the three years, we'll be able to qualify for about three and a half million dollars. So we applied for 1.3 last year, got it, and then as you see this year, it's 472. Um, but we don't want to spend it all at once because there's a need to continue to upgrade as new equipment comes out, new technologies. So um, our percentage, the 15%, which comes out to $70,000, is paid for with Measure L bond funds, so it's not coming out of the general fund. Uh, which is great. We can use E-rate to leverage those bond funds and really have them make a, a great impact in our school sites and, and keep the, the network infrastructure up to the latest technologies. So um, I hope that you'll approve this, uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Are there any speakers to this item? None. Okay. Uh, questions or comments from the board? I'll make a motion. I'll move to approve. <laughs> we have a motion already. You want a second? I'll second. Okay. And then just thank you very much for applying for E-Rate every year. <laughs> How much do we have left in our Measure L um, technology? Well, so there's two kinds, right? There's yeah. the endowment funds. Right. And then there are project funds. Uh -huh. um, and I don't want to give you the wrong information. That's I probably okay. should just give you that. We'll, we'll provide that later. Okay. Um, because but like, we're almost all spent down, though. I yeah, think. yeah. Well, we've been using those, you know, yeah. those project-based funds for, uh -huh. you know, all the AV equipment, the school sites, and then, um, you know, a whole bunch of technology uh, projects across the district, and then using the endowment funds for a lot of the instructional technology and innovative technologies that we're using in the in the classrooms and with students for projects. So, okay. Uh, yeah. And by the way, a member of the public um, let me know that there were no more glitches tonight in the broadcast so they were grateful that whatever you did to fix that well, yeah. it's working it's my pleasure yeah. and, I, and I'm glad that 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 public uh, individual is able to hear the uh, or no it's to see the, 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 the I think uh, both yeah. so, yes. <laughs> okay we have a first and a yes. second all those in favor aye. Aye. aye any opposed motion carries unanimously thank you very much thank you uh, item 9.10, approve a change order number two for the Starlight Elementary School and Merrill Lagasse Kitchen Project, number 2022001. Good evening, President DeSerpa, Dr. Rodriguez, and Board of Trustees. Um, this is the second change order for the Emerald Lagasse Kitchen. Uh, it's in a dollar amount of $19,964.34. The first change order was approved on February 20, or February 9th board meeting uh, in the amount of $24,612.42. Um, the work summarized in the attached change order request number two is required for the following reasons. Item number one, it's a two-part uh, change order. Item number one, in the amount of $18,181.17. Existing conditions underground required working around it and rerouting several services, existing drain lines in the fire Lane required a six inch concrete cap to protect from breaking under weight. The water line for the fire suppression system had to be rerouted around several existing utilities underground to reach the new building. Similarly, the sewer line point of connection was relocated, which required further demolition, excavation, and paving. These changes ensure that the site is left with operational and protected utilities campus wide. Um, Item number two in this change order for the amount of $1,783.17. Uh, the bat insulation specified was not readily available and a substitute was found and agreed upon that meets the same performance requirements. Similarly, a change in the door handle finish was decided to better match the rest of the campus. It's recommended that the board approve the change order request and authorize the planning and facilities department to have the contract um, increased by this amount. Uh, any questions? Are there any speakers? No. Okay, any questions from the board? Just a, a comment. Okay, Jen. Holmes. Just that I, I really appreciate seeing the pictures of the work that's being done and then you know how that relates to the change orders. It just, 
makes it more real. So thank you. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much for the pictures. If anyone hasn't been at Starlight, stop by. It's amazing to see how our field went from green grass to the transformation uh, at the start of the building. So I've been lucky enough um, to be able to visit multiple times and it's great watching it happen. So I will make a motion to approve. I'll second. Yeah. Uh, Trustee Soto. Yeah, the, the bad insulation. What was specified originally? Um, I'm not certain the exact product that was specified. I could find that out. Fiberglass before. blown. Was What's it fiberglass that? or blown insulation? I believe it was fiberglass bats. Oh, and what did they substitute it with? I'm not sure. No, okay. But it, but it's got the same rating. Same, you know, same exact it meets uh, the insulation specs. properties and specs. Yeah. All right. Okay, first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank, Thank you, you, Gary. Now we move on to our consent agenda. Um, before we um, vote on our consent agenda, well, actually, should I pull them so I could thank them? Can I just thank them now? Okay. We do have Oh, a we do have a comment. Okay, I'm sorry. So do we need to pull the item? So maybe we'd have to pull that item. Yeah. What item is it? Uh, item 10.8. Okay. So I'm looking for a motion to I'm, approve the consent agenda. Yes, I, I move to approve the consent agenda deferring item 10.8. And I have a second. Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And um, before we move on to 10.8, I would like to acknowledge donations to the, um, to the Emeril Lagasse Culinary Garden and Teaching Kitchen Project that we just approved the change order for. Um, the first donation is from the California Giant Berry Farm. And um, we're very, very grateful for their donation of, I think it was $10,000, wasn't it? Yeah, there it is. The gift of $10,000. So, so generous. So thank you to the California um, Giant Berries. Yeah, sorry. I'm trying to get out of that. And the next donation was from the Serrano. I think that's a real estate group, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Is it Serrano? Yes. Yeah. Um, from the real estate group called Serrano, the 1% for Good Charitable Foundation. They uh, similarly uh, donated uh, $10,000 um, to our special kitchen that we're building. So thank you to both, to both groups. We couldn't do it without you. So moving on to item under deferred um, consent, uh, to item 10.8. And this item is the MOA United Way um, Santa Cruz first five and migrant and seasonal head start item. Do you want to just do a brief explanation? Right. Explanation. <laughs> so this MOA uh, is with Quality Counts, California, and we apply for funding. We actually are eligible to apply for funding as we keep the quality of services in, in child development programs. Uh, we have to meet requirements on the matrix based on seven different elements. And as we continue going up by points, that's how we qualify to, to apply for the funding. So we do have a speaker. So we'll give you a step aside then the speaker will come up. Yeah, we do have a speaker to this item. Thank you, Angelica. Um, Elizabeth Thorne. I have nothing wrong with this particular um, item. I think it's awesome. I'm just looking for equity. The school nurses don't, ha they have to pay for professional development themselves. We don't get professional development through the district for our licensing and for our credentialing that we have to keep up. The teachers get a professional development and migrant first, you know, Head Start gets professional development. 
The only way we pay for our for perpetual development is out of LEA billing, and this year that was a total of less than $1,000. That's it. That's what it is. And we were told the more you bill, the more you would get, but we only get 10% of what we bill out of the LEA funds. That's all we get, if that. And so $39,000 is great. I, I just, I'm not, I'd just like to see some equity when it comes to professional development for the nurses. That would include our professional organizations, which we are told the district will not pay for even out of the LEA funds that we earn. That's how we get our professional development. It's also how we get our VSP certificates, which provide children with free eye exams and glasses. That's where we get them. So it would just be nice to have a little equity on this one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I need to. We're, I think we need to approve this item. Do, are there any comments from the board on this one? Um, I just. I think this is funded from a block grant, correct? So this is a grant, Migrant Seasonal Head Start, right? Um, in Helicott, we, well, you go out and get many grants to support Migrant Seasonal Head Start and support the professional development of teachers, as well as training for childcare new supplies, all the things that are needed at Migrant Head Start, and many of the programs are funded through block grants, correct? Right. Okay, so this isn't coming money from PVUSD, no. this is a c coming from a grant. So with that, I would like to make a motion to approve this item. I'll second. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Thank you for bringing it forward, and thank you to the, is it the United Way in First Five? I think they were on the, the United Way in First Five. We thank our friends there for supporting our district. Okay, okay um, moving on to item 12, um, close, no, uh, sorry, 13, action reports on closed session. Yeah, so I'm up. All right, so under item um, 2.1. I move to approve the certificated personnel report as presented by the district administration on March 9th, 2022 with 20 and nine additional action items. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes unanimously. Under item 2.2, I move to approve the classified personnel report as presented by the district administration on March 9th, 2022 with nine and 11 additional action items. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Okay. Under item 2.4, the board approved a classified employee discipline agreement in closed session regarding employee number 2589 uh, with a 601 vote. And then under item 2.5, um, the board voted with a 5011 vote to reject the claim identified in closed session item 2.5. Thank That's you. That's all we have. Thank you. So, our upcoming board meeting will be on March 23rd, and I appreciate everyone being here, staff included. Thanks for a great meeting.